2000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3000 Podcast. I'm joined today by a label owner, fashion designer, yep. and old mate of mine, Steve Kirby. Steve, thanks for coming, man. Thank you. It's good to be here finally. You've uh, been at me for a little while. <laughs> I probably should have done it when it was in South Melbourne, though. Much, <laughs> much bigger trek to get down here. It would have been more convenient. I asked yeah, you early days, man, true. and you this weren't This is keen. true. This is true. Uh, we've got a... It's a little disclaimer with you and me. We've got a weird <laughs> coincidence that my mother lives in your old house now. <laughs> That's true. On Montague Street in South Melbourne. <laughs> Don't give her address no, away. No, no, I won't. I no. won't, but... Um, there yeah. was there was the person that I sold it to, she bought it off them. So it wasn't yeah. a straight transaction. No, it wasn't a straight handover, but I think a few demons would have still have to be <laughs> exercised out of the place after you'd been through there. <laughs> you, must, you must add some stories. I was, I was only there for 12 months, man, really? so... Um, yeah, I bought that off Joel Sophie. Remember Joel Sophie? No. Nah. No, nah, okay. No. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> anyway, uh, he's out of the real estate yeah. game now. But uh, no, that was just a quick a quick flipper for yeah. us. Yeah, quite a unique little property there though. Like, uh, But that whole area is changing completely. A big tower going up next to it and the new yeah. poles, everything rolling in. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to get out was because there wasn't a community. But there kind of is now. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, enough. It's not a real estate podcast. No, it's no. a podcast about <laughs> Melbourne, which I, I guess that kind of about my mum. <laughs> no, we're probably no. not. So let's uh, start. I met you around that area, but you didn't grow up there. Do you want to tell people where you grew up and uh, how you got into owning a label? Okay, um, grew up out in the eastern suburbs, so sort of originally Canterbury, Surrey Hills boy, or well, Surrey boy. Um, when I was a teenager, around the time sort of left primary school, high school. Moved to Box Hill, um, yeah, hectic area back then. It was sort of ground zero for the heroin trade in the eastern suburbs. Mm. Good and skate park there, though. Box Hill? I don't know if it was even there back in the day. I don't know. Not too sure, but, uh, yes, yeah, sort of fell into the graffiti scene as a teenager. Um, yeah, that sort of, I was drawn to the hip-hop culture, graffiti, everything, um, and, yeah, sort of cruise from school to school. I was initially at Kingswood, then Rudolf Steiner, where I made some sort of lifelong friends there. Um, got kicked out of there, went to Hawthorne Secondary, which was sort of a big graph school. Um, yeah, I remember the very first day starting there, met Shaheen's brother, Jesse Wahid, at the bus stop um, and almost ended up in a fight with him, then got grabbed by a bunch of dudes like, you do not want to get in a fight with this guy. Do you know who his brother is? <laughs> I don't really give a shit who his brother is, but, yeah, it turns out it was Shaz who owned Obese Records back in the day. <laughs> yeah. But Jesse and I ended up becoming best mates and then from there went on to Swinburne, senior secondary again, yeah, I think asked politely to move on from Hawthorne. Mm-hmm. Um, when I got to Swinburne, again, sort of in the graph scene there. And, yeah. it's <laughs> It doesn't matter who I get on this show, whether it's, Isabel Deltor, who is an international porn star, whether it's somebody who fucking owns a cafe, it doesn't matter, but everyone nah, comes back started, to graffiti. It all started in graffiti. It well, is. Melbourne was, you know, one of the greatest cities in the world for it, I think, you know. Yeah. Really, after it died in New York in the mid-'80s, it sort of the culture really ignited here through books like Subway Art and um, Star Wars, mm-hmm. everything. Yep. So you're at school, you're doing your little bits of graph and stuff. Do you... Want to start doing design? Do you want to do graphic design? What's the next step from I there? Had a passion for the lettering, but I wasn't that good at graph. You yeah. know, like I love the scene, I love the culture, but you know, painting trains. I think it was the thrill of it, uh, the, the illegality or illegal side of it. You know, mm-hmm. we'd ride back of trains after school, um, do back ons, hangouts at the windows. I loved that and the excitement and buzz. But as I said, I just wasn't that good at it but I love seeing your name up somewhere so I guess that I was drawn to that maybe yeah um I didn't know I think coming out of school what I really wanted to do so for a while so I sort of floated around I went to do a hospitality course for a little bit at Box Hill TAFE which ironically I think I went for the first two weeks and just went this is not for fucking me mm. uh, teacher stressed if you get in the hospital game you're going to be working Friday nights Saturday nights potentially Sundays when all your friends have the weekends off you're going to be 
stuck behind a bar or in a kitchen or something. So she did that, a job that, to scare you <laughs> off. That, that was enough to scare me off. Um, ironically, like years later, I got in the mail a responsible service of alcohol certificate just got mailed out to me. It's like, I never even did that unit. And my mum laughed. It's like, Steve, you can't serve yourself alcohol responsibly, let alone, <laughs> let alone getting your certificate in it. But, it's a um, bit of a fast, that thing, though, man. Yeah. Like, I I got one. You can get one in like 48 hours or something. No, I got day. one one day and you just drink beer and they go, this is how, what it's about. And then they stamp your thing and then yeah. you're off. Yeah. And, yeah. So, um, yeah, and then I sort of, my old man growing up had three camera stores. So I was drawn around photography and that sort of um, industry. He passed away when I was about 14. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably what led me off into a lot of that sort of, I wouldn't say negative culture, but going down the graffiti path, drugs path as a teenager. Um, but then when I sort of got serious about work, I found myself sort of easily f to fall into that industry. He had a, had a lot of connections mm -hmm. through the three stores he'd had through a lot of the major photographic companies. So uh, pretty quickly I found myself a job in a retail sort of photographic business sort of floated around that, then working for some professional labs, then eventually went on to a, a photographic supplies company. So I was running around selling camera bags, tripods, memory cards, Meanwhile, two mates of mine who I, one of the mates, Duncan, who I'd grown up with, um, they'd started a screen printing business. He, he was living with me and he was working as a screen printer. Him and another guy, Michael, they decided to start their own brand eventually. They'd been printing for other brands for ages. Mm -hmm. I suppose a lot of their business came through hardcore brands, which was Mooks, Mossimo, all back in the day. And then also they'd have kids come in like every every week, every fortnight, right, we want to start a clothing brand. So they'd print those startup brands. The problem is it's not long-term business that they come in, they do one range, then they don't come back for months on end or they do a second range and they can't afford to pay for the printing, everything. like They gave it to their mates. Go, jumping from one startup to another is not a consistent sort of business model. And Mooks, Mosmo, hard, the hardcore brands, they eventually one day just turned around and said, that's it, we're not doing anything locally, we're going 100% to China offshore. Mm -hmm. So they found literally overnight their business had dried up like 100%. Um, they did have their own brand before I came on board, which is called Karma, and it was Michael and another guy, Nick Bowes. It had the back-to-front R on it. Correct, yeah, that was huge. So they mm -hmm. launched, they did big fashion week parties, they took it in, they got it into Maya within one of the first collections or something, and like literally climbed very quickly and were quite successful with it. But... Uh, yeah, it all sort of fell apart. I think he hit bankruptcy within 12 to 18 months anyway and then they really? sort of split up. Michael took the screen printing business. Nick, he moved off to Los Angeles and took Karma over there and he did big things with it there. I think he ended up on one of those TV shows like um, Who Wants to Be a Supermodel or something and he was on there. And <laughs> Who Wants to Be a Supermodel? Yeah, he, he got uh, a lot of celebrities rocking into it and sort of evolved it into a denim brand. So it was more about denim jacketing. Uh, sorry, not denim, leather jacketing. I yeah. Saying. That was that was the period where you could just have a like pixelated like color halftone chick on there with the finger up, <laughs> yeah, and that and that was your t-shirt. Well, yeah, that was one of the tees that made Death by Zero. <laughs> yeah. It was uh, Naomi, was it Naomi Klein? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, but yeah, and it was all sort of around Gravel Street at that point in time. That was the hub, you know. You, don't forget, there was no social media, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, no TikTok. If you wanted to hunt down a brand, you had to go to, all right, where do the hot brands sort of launch, where they come about. So Greville Street was probably the hub, you know. You yeah. had to get it into some cool boutiques around there and on a Saturday people would go down there. You know, the only thing we had was Street Press. It was like yeah. so Fashion the, Journal or Beat or Impress, but they, Beat and Impress didn't cover fashion much. No, and that was a really interesting time, I guess, because it was before uh, – nothing was – seemed too serious then, right? Mm. People would go out on a Saturday, buy T-shirts, buy clothes, go out Saturday night. That was like kind of like a thing around Chapel Street and yeah. stuff. It changed pretty quickly. Yeah, you go down and have, have breakfast, brunch, you know, get your gear for that weekend yeah. or that night out, you know. Get your other gear. <laughs> <laughs> and dudes, I think the Australian guy was really just discovering fashion at that point. Mm. I remember 20 years ago, if you put product in your hair, guys look at you know, you're Metrosexual. That was the metrosexual thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like David Beckham was considered like, oh, this guy's got style and he does his hair and everything, you know, and that's where that whole sort of thing came about. It's like, yeah, the, the Euro boys would get into it, like the WOG boys, you know, they'd, yeah. they'd dress up to the nines to go out to clubs and bars. But I'm talking your typical sort of Anglo-Aussie guy, 
it just was almost frowned upon, you know. You, yeah. You're around port. Can you imagine the port boys? Like, oh, I was. <laughs> they used to... Uh, used it was to... like if you were into fashion, they were, oh, he's a bit... Oh, mate, what's going on with Maloney? He's a bit... <laughs> that was <laughs> it. The footy, the footy guys Takes a bit <laughs> much care in how he dresses and everything. He's like, now that's just the standard. standard it's like... Yeah. Now, if you don't, you know. That the skinny I, I, jeans I, were frowned upon yeah. big time. I used to oh, get yeah. all sorts for that, yeah. And I mean, it, it took a degree in the graffiti scene. It was like, yeah, you know, graffiti guys had swag. There was a culture. There was like mm. Tommy Hilfiger jackets, baggy jeans, Explorer sort of stuff like, you know, yeah. Columbia, Ralph, Polo, Ralph Lauren. That was, yeah, the, the fashion was definitely a thing for the graffiti guys probably before that metrosexual thing yeah. happened. Those guys cared a little bit more about their garments sort of yeah. from a Melbourne oh, point of view. And we were influenced by hip-hop, you know. It yeah. was, you saw the hip-hop film clips coming out and you would start to watch Rage at midnight, you know, just to see an hour of hip-hop, yeah. see what Wu-Tang was wearing. See that was it. You'd get back from a party, man, and it would be like a hip-hop special. You'd be fucking stoked oh, because yeah. it wasn't any internet. Set you the VHS go, cassette tape <laughs> yeah. to record it so you could play that back for the next, you know, Year. <laughs> so Anytime you had a party, it was there was no YouTube, so throw on the cassette and then we got it. Lauren Hill and Nas. <laughs> um, so then these guys, so you start working for the screen printer and that starts your No, well they asked me. I was I was running around Melbourne as a sales rep at that point in time, selling the camera bags, memory cards, tripods to stores, and they so when they lost all the business going overseas, Michael, around the same time, I think he had a holiday book to go to Bali with his girlfriend at the time. And when he was over there, he sort of saw T-shirts getting sold at the markets for like $3 or $5 Australian. And they had, you know, all the brand rip-offs at every Adidas, whatever. And he thought, well, hang on, if they're selling these T-shirts finished with a print for $3 on the side of the street, what can I buy a blank one for? Or what can I buy 5,000 blank ones for? And so I think he did an order whilst he was over there and just said, I want to bring 5,000 blank T-shirts back into Australia. What about the quality control on that stuff, though? Oh, it was dog shit in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Bali. That's doing business in Bali. Yeah. Someone once said to me, if, you, you know, if you're serious about business, you've got to go to China. If you want to surf and root and stay in villas, then go to Bali and do yeah. your business there. Well, Bangladesh now seems to be where it's at. A lot of oh, people... For bigger companies, yeah. Right. You know? And I suppose the cost of business in China has gone up. But, um, yeah, so you brought in, I think, about 5,000 blank T-shirts and launched a brand called Mickey Six at mm -hmm. the time which was a lot of bright coloured T-shirts. So your fluoro blues, greens, yellows with pink print on it. There was another brand at the time, Travesty, was probably doing a similar thing. Travesty was yeah. like the footy player's yeah. fucking brand for a long oh, time. Yeah. Everyone had yeah. it in every different... Yeah. White Charlie. They were all sort of... But that was, around. that was like Stevie's, mate, wasn't Stevie, it? Stevie, yeah. Well, Stevie was another one another and they one. were doing the yeah. fluoro jeans and everything. So it was all bright colours. And you remember dudes had sort of... Roy. Swift their hair up. Roy is actually one of my neighbours and good friend of mine. Oh, really? We've met in COVID, yeah. yeah That's an old mother story. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. He's no. got an interesting Melbourne story, I don't imagine. Yeah. Mm. Well, you need to get him on here. Yeah, you have to well, ask I'll, him. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah, you go down Chapel Street and uh, it's funny, there's a lot more, I think, self, like more identity these days in how people dress and – uh, you walk down Chapel Street back then and you walk past a group of five guys and they all had the same amount of product, the same head, uh, same hairdo, same amount of product in their hair, wearing the same type of jeans and the same brand T-shirts, yeah. you know, which, which is good if you're selling them those T-shirts because totally. it meant all five guys in the crew would be wearing your brand and I'd see that. But It was very much, there wasn't much individuality then, no. I guess, and that's probably no. because the internet hadn't evolved for social media and that yeah. sort of thing. But and if, the face of Melbourne's changed, you know, the, the mm, demographic. Of, yeah. Yeah, it, it was an interesting time because there was the, – I remember like the b more boutique places, like Fat was where like yeah. a lot of people wanted to get their product in, which had, I think like I was talking the other day on Instagram about Swipe and also like uh, Subi sort of was in those yeah. sort of stores and that was kind of like your pinnacle for a boutique sort of thing. Was that about that time you reckon? Yeah, definitely I reckon, probably early 2000s. So this was about 2005. Yep. Yeah. Um, they dropped their first range and I think they did reasonably well with it. So they got it into Edge and Universal, but uh, which just wouldn't happen these days. Like yeah. you're not going to drop a first range but and just get it straight into big stores. But I think they looked at it and went, yeah, the product's unique, the price is right. So he asked me, Michael, uh, who owned the business, did you want to come on board and maybe help us with sales? And as I said, I was already running around as a sales rep, so I kind of just – I hated the job I was doing. So I thought, well, I could do this on the side. If I'm going to every shopping centre, I can stick my head in the menswear store or the clothing boutique and see if I can try and sell them something. And pretty quickly, you know, camera stores – this was at the end of an era. Camera stores were on the way out. So 
having grown up with my old man with three stores, I'd sort of seen the boom of them in the 80s and 90s with film and everything. But then when digital cameras came in, it would just spell the decline of it, you know. Mm-hmm. You don't even print photos these days. Like everything gets posted to social media. You don't you don't have any camera unless you're seriously into photography. Mm-hmm. You shoot on your mobile phone these days. You know, that's how you transport and show your photos. But I could see the camera stores were sort of really declining and you'd walk in and sort of do an order and they'd buy maybe some camera bags, tripods, memory cards. You might get a $700 order and walk out, walk in a clothing store across the road from it in the same centre and you'd do sort of two three thousand $3,000 order. So pretty quickly I saw, all right, I think this is going to be more lucrative and down the path I wanted to go into. Yeah. Um, so Michael got me on board selling and instantly I sort of took over and got him into a whole bunch of Victorian boutiques. Uh, and then eventually I went and became the sort of national sales manager. And then I think on the next range I was sort of sitting there over his shoulder when he was designing stuff and just feeding him ideas. Like, yeah, you should move that there. You should – how about this? How about, how about a whole different T-shirt idea? How about this? And, yeah, he sort of – quickly said all right I think I need you here to actually designing and putting the ranges together with me mm-hmm. uh, and then he just gave you a job yeah well suddenly became national sales manager <laughs> slash brand manager slash design manager yeah yeah and then the evolution of fashion has to change because I remember about that time that travesty, travesty thing was everywhere mm. and then that just falls out of favor because all over green prints on Purple T-shirts can't last oh, forever. It, it, I remember standing at my music bowl on like a New Year's Day one time. It was like summer days or whatever, the yeah. Vibrations Festival. And we're standing at the top of the hill, me and one of the other guys, Duncan, who worked with us. And we looked out and it was a sea of people. Yeah. And it was, it was not like spot the person in your clothing brand. It's like, I don't think I could count right now how many are like they're everywhere. But as I said, guys didn't have that, you know, individual sort of style. It was a bit more flock mentality back then. And yeah. guys were wearing, you know, to a big degree, all the same sort of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then, but we saw that coming and we sort of already started to pivot prior to the end of it and we launched Death by Zero in 2007. Mm-hmm. And with that, we went, all right, fluoro, all that's running absolutely hot at the moment. Let's pivot the exact opposite direction. When they say when everyone's running, maybe that's time to walk, you know, and yeah. when and everyone's walking, that's when you want to fucking run. Right. So you so go more we monotone? Went, we went black and white. We went these tapered sort of T-shirts with V-necks. Um, very dark sort of art, gothic prints from the first range. And that sort of really took off Death by Zero. Um, and I and guess you've got the connections with the, the chains of stores. So it's yeah, an easy Yeah, so we, la- we launched it straight away into Edge over Christmas. It was actually sort of we partnered a little bit with the buyer and discussed it with her and she had some input. And I think she came up and was like, oh, it should be a real edgy name like Rehab or Death Pop. <laughs> Whack. <laughs> um, but like maybe the death bit. I kind of like that. Like what? It should just mean nothing. Like death by zero. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Duh, there's the brand name. There's you brand. know. Yeah. And just got this sort of font, or created this sort of font where it was like I want it to look like a kindergarten kids. <laughs> a kid in kinder's written it. Like it's mm-hmm. not even trying to be stylish. It just looks terrible. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. And then that's so that then takes over Mickey Six's. Oh, of- completely sort of blew it away. And one day we. I can't even remember the very – I think it was that Heidi Klum print where she sort of stand there topless flipping the bird. I think we put that on a T-shirt and it just went gangbusters. We could not keep up with the demand. We had to keep reprinting it, reprinting it. But I you're printing it on internally. So we were printing everything on Graham Street in Port Melbourne. Yeah, we're up above a car wash at this point in time, mm-hmm. which was always interesting because downstairs in the car wash they used to do a lot of the police cars coming through and the guys in the car wash would sort of come running up the stairs and like, Excuse me, boys, we've got about 10 cops downstairs. Can you, like, just put the joints out for a minute? Because <laughs> the cops are all standing, just smelling the building up. What the hell's going on? Probably thought a grow was going on upstairs or whatever. But, yeah, screen printing is pretty monotonous work. So, the, you know, I was never really hands-on in the screen printing side of it. But, you know, the boys that were standing there printing, just loading T-shirts all day, they're having a beer, they're smoking a joint whilst they're doing the job, you know. Yeah, and so hand, hands-on workplace there. So you're literally coming up with the design here and printing it over there. Yeah, so we're bringing the blank T-shirts out of Bali and then printing them all on Graham Street there, which also meant we were very quick to market. So whilst most fashion brands are sort of designing nine months out, going to sample, producing the sample collection, that's maybe a three-month process, then selling into store. You've got about a six-month lead time there, so you sell to the shops. That's how we're doing it at the moment. So we just finished summer sell. We've just finished uh, designing our second summer range, but you're always sort of six, selling to stores about six months out. Mm. We sort of just popped up and went, hey, we can deliver these T-shirts in two weeks. Right. And every store we got it into, it would just 
couldn't keep up with the demand with it. It was quite incredible. So then where does that take you? So I guess, but that's kind of a cool place to be where you can go, all right, this T-shirt's happening right now. Mm. In two weeks we can replenish the stock. Yeah, well, that was the beauty. We could recut like that. You know? If Normally if they're dealing with a supply producing in China or overseas, it's like, all right, we want to place a refill. Or cool, you'll get that stock in three months, whereas... They come back and say, you know, mate, that flu, we need another 500 of it. Mm-hmm. Go, cool, we'll get in store in two weeks, done. You know? So then do you think about taking the brand, like keep producing in Australia but taking it overseas, marketing it somewhere else? Uh, not till later. So from there to about 2010, we just sort of rode that wave really in Australia and tried to grow as much as we could in Australia. Um, and then about 2009, Michael said to me, so look, you're selling. Back then most of the major chains were sort of, unique to different states. They weren't glo- national, how they are now. So you sort of had Universal was Queensland, Glue was Sid- was Sydney or New South Wales, Edge was in Victoria, you had Live over in Western Australia. And we sort of like, all right, we've got the major chain store in each state. And Michael, I think one night, was back at the office having a drink and chat and he's, what do you want to do next? And I said, I want to fucking go overseas. You know, I want to take this mm-hmm. brand internationally. So that, I suppose, was the next step. Um, Fighting down on the peninsula... Uh, Jack and Jean in Frankston it was a huge part of the the journey. Um, I was down there one time and Jack and Jean, if you don't know it, it was not, opened in 1970. It was one of the first denim stores to ever open in Victoria. Uh, Pete McKenzie, legend, mentor of mine. I was down there visiting him one day and just chatting to him. Oh, he wasn't in the store, I don't think. I was chatting to his wife and she was saying, oh, you know, he's getting old, he's getting near retirement, but he's still got so much fire in his belly and still, you know, wants to wants to be involved in the rag trade and still wants to be involved in the industry. And Pete was the sort of guy you could sit there and come out the back of the shop and have a coffee with me and you sit down and chat to him. He's like, oh, Steve, I was one time I was in JFK airport and I'm in the airport lounge and I was there with Tommy and hey, me and Tommy having a beer and suddenly Kelvin walked in the room. I'm like, <laughs> hold on, Tommy? He's like, yeah, yeah, Tommy, he'll figure. I'm like, sorry, Kelvin? He's like, yeah, Kelvin Klein's walked in the lounge and those two weren't getting along at this time. I was like, Holy shit, <laughs> you're running a store in Frankston and, like, <laughs> this is the experience you'd have. Like, you need to bottle this shit. <laughs> yeah. This stuff needs to be archived. Like, you're a legend of the game. Is legend. he still with us? Legend. Yeah, I caught up with him uh, this week, actually. He sold the business some years ago, but he'd be 70, just turned 78 the other day. Yeah, wow. Um, but, yeah, from that and when his wife made the comment, oh, he's still got so much fire in his belly, sort of uh, thought... Maybe he'd be a good place to start. Maybe just have a talk to him and say, look, I want to take brands overseas. How do we go about it? Um, and as soon as I mentioned it to him, he's like, all right, say, say no more. <laughs> Let's get I'll, I'll, I'll come see you next week. I'll put a plan together. I've got some contacts. And it started with a guy, Dan Wallen, who was known as Diesel Dan. So a lot of people came through the old Jack and Jean cycle over the years. The John Kors worked there, I think, Funky Cole, uh, Nicky Whelan, uh, it could go on and on. Like there was all these people that went on to do incredible things. People that started fashion agencies, their own brands, all worked at that retail store. They and probably learned some in business funky town. stuff there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, Dan Warland, he was studying geology, like rocks or some shit. He was in a cafe <laughs> just having a coffee with his girlfriend, and Lynn, Pete's wife, walked in. Saw him there having a coffee, and just, just grabbed him. He's like, "You need to come work at our retail." And he's like, "No, I'm studying geology or something." So, no, nah, you've got the look. You could sell denim all day long. You, the girls would eat out the palm of his hand. So I don't know how she convinced him, but she managed to convince him to come work in the denim store there and he, lo- he loved it. That took off, started a passion for him. So he moved to London and got a job at Diesel in the Covent Garden store there. And I think Renzo, the guy that owned Diesel, he used to come in on the regular and sort of check out. That was one of their flagship sort of London stores. He always come in and was always impressed by how neatly the denim was stacked and how it was folded because that's a big thing in denim stores. Mm. Another story about Dakota 501, actually, I'll tell you <laughs> at some point. But, um, yeah, Renzo then invited him to come work at the head office in Milan and he ended up heading up their menswear. So he became menswear director at Diesel, yeah, wow. lived on Lake Como, married one of the Irish models that <laughs> modelled for Diesel. So Pete had obviously had him come through the store and they were still really tight friends, so he hit him up, I think. Um, he came to see us the following week down in Port Melbourne at our offices there and said, all right, look, there's a trade show on in Berlin called Bread and Butter. I think we need to get over there. Um, we'll, it's Berlin Fashion Week. We'll go over, we'll sit, meet, meet up with Dan. He's going to be there. He's got some contacts he's going to introduce us to. Uh, 
yes, we got on a plane, went over there to Berlin. We didn't show the first time. We didn't have a stand or anything, but we met up with Dan. He introduced us to a guy, Ben Sibthorpe, who was repping, remember PRPS, like a Japanese sort of denim brand. It was big, oh, big no. embroidery and oh, big baggy yeah, yeah. jeans. Um, yeah. He was repping that. Kind of like Iversu sort of? Yeah, yeah, around that sort of time. Yeah. Yeah, he was repping that in London, but he took the brand on for the UK uh, and he introduced us to some other people. So we met a Dutch team and they took it on for the Holland, you know, Bel- uh, Holland, Belgium. I can't remember, is it Luxembourg? I can't remember. Those three countries all fall in this one territory. So you're venturing into Ger- denim though? Or are you doing... No, no, just, just, doing just with the T-shirts. Printed tees. Just printed tees, yeah. Yeah. And with the first collection, Ben in the UK, he got into Selfridges and Harvey Nichols, which is... My mind still blows to this day. Like, that's the pinnacle of, I suppose, department store in the UK, you know, right on Oxford Street. But it was weird because it was very bootleg shit we were doing, you know. It was, mm-hmm. you're putting these photos which we weren't buying and weren't licensing. And we had Cape Moss, like, smoking cigarettes on some of the T-shirts. But the thing is, when you're in Selfridges, Cape Moss fucking shops in there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you end up in the situation where Cape Moss walks into Selfridges and like, Hang on a moment, what am I doing on a T-shirt? So cease and desist letters. Come. Yes, we started getting them. Yeah. Um, because we had this table just at the top of one of the escalators and it was just covered in our T-shirts all stacked up and they were doing like £10,000 a week on that table, just off that table. Can they hit you up for that revenue or they can just tell you to stop fucking printing? Stop printing generally, Yeah. yeah. That, but it, it is a bit of a grey area with that sort of stuff with the licensing, especially I'm guessing around then where, you know, it was a little bit like the Wild West. You print something on a T-shirt and do it until someone tells you you can't yeah, It's do different it. in different territories. I believe in America is very litigious about that sort of thing because essentially you could draw Biggie Smalls yep. yourself, your own hand drawing, and put it on a T-shirt and they'll say, well, that's his likeness, that's his brand. So yep. it doesn't matter that you drew it. Whereas here there's this whole... Thing if you change something by 20%, 30%, you can claim it your own. So technically you can take a photo of Biggie Smalls and all right, I'm going to put red sunglasses on him and rip out the mouth from the picture and change mm. it all. And then it's like, well, hang on, it's been changed by a certain percentage. And it sort of falls back generally to the photographer, so who owns the image. Mm. So then you've got – are you still printing the tees – in Graham Street, Port Melbourne, and then shipping them over to the we UK. We were initially, the, yeah, we were initially. So I think we we came back from that trip um, and sort of got to work straight away. They had took some samples out. They got, as I said, Ben got us into the big department stores in the UK. The Dutch team, they absolutely killed it. I don't know what it is with Holland, but they just ate it up. It's, uh, the Dutch all sort of like the Aussie kids want to go to London and sort of when you graduate high school, go to London base yourself there, get a pub job, then travel Europe. For the Dutch, it was all like, we want to come to Australia. You know, when you turn 18, 19, it was a big thing. So I don't know, they had this affinity with Australian brands and Australian culture and everything. So you were av- you were marketing it as an Aussie brand? Yeah. Or is it just a streetwear kind of... I don't even know if we ever called ourselves streetwear. It was kind of... It's more fashion, I suppose. We were targeted more at the fashion boutiques. I mean, they're quite tapered carts. You had V-necks on everything. Yeah. yeah. So, they, but you, knew, you were using that... Aussie angle to your advantage. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then where are you? Where does do you th- do you think? All right, we've got this this foothold into this fashion industry. We need to start doing something more than t shirts, or is it just you? Do- I, I wanted to. Like, yeah. I wanted to. Michael, who owned the business, he was very sort of single focus, and it's just nah. I just want to be t shirt print, and that was his background. He come from graphic design background, and him and Duncan who sort of started the business initially together. Michael owned it outright, but Duncan and me had grown up together in high school. Um, yeah, they screen printing, graphic design background. They just, no, nah, let's just do that. Mm-hmm. And it was hard in Bali because we are manufacturing everything in Bali at that point in time where it's easy to do a T-shirt. At the moment you start talking fleece in Bali, I mean, the island's 28, 30 degrees a year <laughs> round. It's like That's... hoodies aren't a massive selling item in Bali. Yeah. Well, not... Well, not for uh, tourists anyway, I suppose. For locals, you see plenty of them getting around on scooters on a 30-degree day, day yeah. in, in a hoodie. But, yeah, with their thongs on as well. Yeah. Um, but so do you – at some point, I guess, the demand's got to get – that you can't just keep producing them. Like, that, that's got to be a big loop there to get your shit from Indonesia, bring it to Port Melbourne, take, send it back over to Europe and then distribute it. Like, yeah. there's got to be an easier fucking way yeah, to Yeah, but do it was great because the whole Austrade scheme, so that if we were actually producing in Australia, it gave us all this sort of government grants for – overseas travel which made it very nice you could business car class flights always there and back yeah, wow. to europe twice a year to do the fashion trade shows 
the whole trade trade show itself, like you look at a thirty, forty thousand dollars for a stand there and the build of the stand, you know, that's not counting your cost of getting over there, your hotels, meals, all that. Yep. But all that was sort of picked up. You get fifty percent rebate back from the government through Oz Trade Scheme. Is that still a thing? I believe so. There was these goods, I can't remember, it was like a beatboxer and he had a sampling machine. You probably know them from around St Kilda, but we saw them in um Dam Square in Amsterdam oh. on that first trip. Is it Ben Stanford, Dub FX? Yes. He went to, yeah, he went to yes. Sandy. Yeah, so yeah. they were selling CDs in Dam Square when, yeah. we first arrived Cade, at, yeah. when we first arrived in Amsterdam. And we went up, we watched them perform. We're like, oh, this is incredible. You know, you're in Amsterdam. You feel like you're taking in the local culture. And when they finished performing, we went up and like, dude, that was so dope. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> your accent, you're from Melbourne. And they're like, yeah, St Kilda, <laughs> Port Melbourne. I was like, get fucked. We're on the other side of the world. <laughs> and here yeah, we are. So they're thinking we're taking in local culture. Yeah. Turns out they're from 2Ks up the road. Right. But they were selling, they were making their CDs in Australia and then importing them, like actually getting them printed and pressed and everything in Australia. Yeah. Because they qualified them for the Australian government grant and that meant all we travel, hotels, expenses, you can claim 50% of it back through the government. So. Fuck. Shouldn't give away too much. Well, <laughs> I, I need to speak ATR. to my, I need it to all gets, to my Every head. claim gets audited though, so you have to be very, you have to have yeah. everything down. And most people I know actually get lawyers to actually f- submit the claim Makes because sense. every claim is audited. So it's not like your tax where you sort of lodge it and once every now in a blue moon someone gets audited, these everything gets gone over the fine tooth comb and they'll come back to you asking what's this here and what's this there. Yeah, but you're overseas, yeah. fucking like what well, everything's a, you know you got to do stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. it's yeah, it's a good loophole. Yeah. It's nice to lay down when you're flying. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> so then, what's the what's the next step in this in this journey, man? Because I'm like I didn't even like I knew your story to an extent. Mm. I didn't even know about Death by Zero having success overseas. It's not really something that yeah. I kind of knew about. So what what happens? What happens next? Uh, look, it was probably so f- that was 2010 when we first launched into Europe. It really peaked like 2011, 2012, probably after a couple of years in the market over there. Like when I remember clearly when we started, when I came on board with Michael and Duncan in their first year, I think they'd done $400,000 turnover for the year. And around that 2012 point in time, we hit eight and a half million wow. in 12 months yeah. in a financial year. But we were printing everything in Port Melbourne. So it grew from a team of like three or four of us to suddenly there was 19 staff, you know, a new building we'd bought in Port Melbourne, you know. Uh, downstairs they're all drinking, smoking on whilst they're printing T-shirts and upstairs in the office everyone's doing coke whilst they're designing <laughs> and selling. <laughs> and that, that didn't, f- you know, foster a very healthy workplace culture, there's I suppose. There's a few heads <laughs> I know that got jobs there and I uh, don't know. Yeah, there's a... Yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was riding that wave but, yeah. as I said, it didn't foster a healthy culture yeah. in that sense. And, yeah, 2012 were probably really peak, 2013. I suppose, like anything, you've got to innovate. You've got to be ready for what's Instagram next. Instagram comes out. Yeah, you know, and that probably changed the game a lot as well. Mm. By 2015, thereabouts, 2014, I think, started seeing a bit of a harder road. And as I said, Michael, I don't want to speak out of school, he was very single-focused. He just wanted to do T-shirts and he was always, if the brand doesn't work, we can flip that and we'll launch the new one. I thought, hang on, when you so, it takes so much to build a brand, you know, mm. there's so many parts and when you've got something... A lot of people said that, like, you've got one of the biggest brands, but you're just doing T-shirts. Like, you can sell beach towels, you can sell stubby holders, you can sell anything. If you just put Death by Zero on it, you know, if that's the hottest brand. Yeah. Um, but by 2015, he hit hard roads and it was all sort of went into administration. So pretty quickly I found myself out of a job overnight. Um, yeah. I was sort of entertained going to work with a couple other brands. I went and had some meetings with some bigger brands based in Melbourne. Sort of went on board with one for a couple of weeks um, and very quickly realised, like, no, nah, I'm 35. I don't want to go to work for someone else again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was at home one night and got a phone call from one of the guys that owned chain of stores in WA and he said, I just landed in Melbourne Airport, going to take you out for dinner. And I said, dude, I'm unemployed. I'm not in the rag trade anymore. He said, no, it doesn't matter. Come on, let's go out for dinner. And we'd always had been really close, had a tight relationship. Another sort of guy, you know, when you lose your dad at a young age, I suppose you collect it. You collect father figures along the way in life or Mm -hmm. mentors in the industry. I didn't have someone to show me. So Pete very much was one of those guys from Jack and Jean, Pete McKenzie, Hayden Marchetto from Live in WA. He was another one of those guys and he came and picked me up and took me out for dinner. Remember Doc in Mm -hmm. Albert Park? Then Now now down here in Mornington, 
But he took me out for dinner there and we just got talking for a while. He said, Steve Durning, your mates wear Death by Zero. I said, no. <laughs> he said, why is that? I said, well, they're all the streetwear and hip hop. And he said, yeah, you grew up in the graffiti culture. Well, those boys wear Death by Zero. I said, no. I said, well, why don't you do a brand that your mates would wear, <laughs> that, that, that you'd wear? You know, where, where do you see? What's your influence or what do you love? I grew up probably same as you, you know, still see Mossimo back in the day, cross colours, the baggy jeans in the 90s. That's the shit we were about. Mm -hmm. Sports as well, crossover. Um, so I thought, yeah, there's an opportunity there. And that was probably right at the time when streetwear was popping off, like Culture Kings had come up big time in the scene, you know. Mm -hmm. They'd really ridden that wave of streetwear exploding onto the consumer in Australia um, and saw there's an opportunity maybe here to create a brand and get to tell my own story mm -hmm. through that brand. Uh, yep. So over dinner, he's just look. We've got ten stores in WA. If you want, if you're serious about this, you want to do it. If the product's good, I'll guarantee I'll put them in those ten stores overnight. Business partner Brendan, uh, he had a couple of retail doors in Bendigo, Ballarat. So we already sort of knew, all right, we'll at least have that foundation that we can sell to those stores to start off with. And I thought, given my sort of ten year experience, all right, I should be able to get out there and have a crack and sort of rattle a few cages and get it into a few boutiques and that. To, um, for the first collection, so yeah. Next thing, I went home that night, and Michael had given him. He allowed me to take my computer home for when the company went into administration. I think I opened the iTunes library, and I always used to pick music a lot of the days in the office. Mm -hmm. and I checked what's the number one song most ever played, and it was this track, "The Wanderer" by Johnny Cash and U2. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of linked back to my graffiti days, and I remember in Star Wars, my favourite scene where they sort of ask him. Oh. They asked this old couple on the street, like, have you heard of Scene? Do you know Scene, S-E-E-N? Or was that his name? Or would he use an underplume? And it cuts this whole montage of all scenes, trains, and it's got that Dion and the Belmont song, well, I'm the type of guy, never settled down, where pretty girls are, you know I'm around, I'm yeah. the Wanderer. And it just stuck. I thought, that's a great brand name, but I think Wanderer spelt out is too long. It's too many letters, mm. terrible on a T-shirt, you know. The best punchy brand names are something nice and short, like the old penultimate brand name, Nike. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's four letters, it's symmetrical. You can cut it in half, you've got twos. Like, good brand names, four or five letters maximum, you know. Mm. So I thought, well, I like the Wanderer thing and it's also, you know, I suppose it's summed up something I think a lot of people could have an affinity to or connect with. Yeah. Uh, Took the vowels out, W-N-D-R-R. -R. Did it confuse? It Did people still call it W-N-D-R-R? -R? Oh, I get a lot of people <laughs> saying Winder. <laughs> Winder. Oh, is that, uh, we've sent it out to influencers on the gram and some girls will um, do an unboxing and be like, oh, my God, it's this new product, Winder. I love it. I'm just obsessed with my Winder hoodie. Yeah, the obsessed. <laughs> it was the two dots. Like it's the accent that really fucking is, is that a nod to Stussy, the two dots? <laughs> nah, I think it just uh, working with a guy. So Nick came to work with us at Shy Clothing in the later stages uh, and he then went on to big things. He was Culture King's head designer for quite a while. He's now working with Foot Locker. Um, but, yeah, I hit Nick up and... I sort of mentored him in his time whilst he was down. In, he'd moved down from Brisbane quite young, like 18, 19. He was a single single dad, so he had a lot on his plate. Um, but, yeah, I hit him up and uh, I'd love you to come up with some logo design for us and everything. You got the con you had the concept with the, the just the vowels. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And then so he came up with that and that he became came your logo. trademark sort of thing. And it's, it's, it was, it, it's totally different to where – that fashion stuff was previously because with the other brands, you didn't really put your brands on the T-shirt. You just had generic prints. No, and so it was, this it was is more art print, yeah, so we yeah. didn't really do logo T. So that was the real pivot that was suddenly it is about the brand and, you know, T-shirts has to sell off the name. It's not some big all-over print. I say with design, that's the hardest thing as well. Like when you do a really complicated design, you can hide all the faults in it. Mm -hmm. The hardest design to do is the most simplistic, you know, yeah. because there's no room to hide. Everything has to be perfect. And we launched the first range. We probably got it into maybe 15, 20 stores nationally. And it was probably a struggle a little bit with some of the logo tees because no one had heard of what the fuck's Wander or Winder or WNDR. It didn't mean anything to anyone. But we had this one T-shirt and it was just uh, clip art hands like that mm -hmm. and Mickey Mouse sort of clip art hands. And on the back and big cartoon font, was, we're going to be all right, like the Kendrick Lamar mm -hmm. quote from the song. And, yeah, that just went gangbusters as well. And I always sort of knew it was like, I said the old saying, you can throw a lot of shit and just see what sticks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? 
It was a little bit of that. I'd like to say it was very... We knew who our customer was and we knew what we were going to go after and we had a guy in mind and we thought streetwear's blowing up and, you know, as you said, Stussy was having this big time and Culture Kings was. It was like, who's flying the flag from Melbourne and where? We do it better than anyone down here, you know? Like, yeah. in, hence you got the 3,000 podcasts. You're interested. Yeah. You're, you're interviewing Melbourne people. Yeah. You know? it's and the sneaker culture, sneaker culture was, pick, was popping off as well. A yeah. lot of people were getting into that and that the reselling thing and that's a whole, yeah. Yeah. So then... Your first range, are you doing just tees? You're sticking with what you know? No, we did tees, hoodies, long sleeves. I think we dropped some pants as well because I was adamant after so many years, 10 years just doing Mm T-shirts. This was my own time to actually tell my own story and I thought from the get-go, like even if I'm not going to make money out of doing the pants or whatever, hoodies I think goes hand-in-hand with T-shirts, you know, Mm, the the streetwear is like they're your two core items. So it blows my mind we never really did the fleece, yeah, shy clothing in those days across all those brands. But, yeah, I thought this is my chance to tell my own story. I want it to, I was adamant I want it to be a collection. I want it to have some hats, accessories, everything in it. Mm. And then are you, are, you, are you going straight to produce offshore or you're thinking, like, we can still do this? We tried. So Brendan and I went to Bali. Because we... that's what you knew. <laughs> Well, no, we actually, ironically, we both had holidays booked around the same time. I just lost my job, so I was like, I need to just recharge, just go away for a couple of weeks. I'd been yeah. through a lot of shit in the final sort of months of the business and it all ended up pretty bad So there was ownership of the factory involved and everything. Um, I just needed a break just to get away. So my sister was actually good enough to say, look, I'm going to take us both to Bali. You need a break, you know, reset. Brendan was actually booked to go over with his brother at the same time. So we're like, that's perfect. We're, we're going into business together. We're both going to be off on a holiday at the same time together. And then, ironically, four or five days before we were due to take off, my sister got made redundant in her job, so she lost the job. So we're all set to go. Then next thing, the volcano started erupting over there, shut down the whole Denpasar airport, everything in the Gurai got grounded. So we were just waiting, waiting. Finally, we made it over there. We sent some stuff to some factories, but it's just too hard. As I said, they say in Bali, everything, it's rubber band time, so island time. Like, ah, maybe tomorrow. Ah, maybe next week. Yeah. Ah, maybe the week after that. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. And we thought, well, we're going to be screwed. If we can't meet delivery deadlines, you don't want to fuck up on your first delivery then wholesale. If you promise a store something, and all right, this is a January delivery or the February, we're going to get it in there and it's going to be delivered. If you start... That up on your first go, then yeah, you're just no room for error. So eventually, I think we just signed off on AS Color. Just went, you know what, stuff it. Let's just buy AS Color, relabel it as our own, and and that's how everyone was really starting a streetwear brand at that point in time because it was tried and tested. You knew the garments had washed up well. Mm, yeah, I suppose everyone was doing it for merch, bars, barber shops. And they were producing in New Zealand and they hadn't gone to Bangladesh. I think. No, they? I'm no. pretty sure it was all out of China or Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah New no. Zealand. Or, Originally, I th- yeah, I think Based. that's what it was. Well, the boys are from New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. yeah, and they probably exploded just at that right time as well because it was right at the time where everyone wanted to start a brand. Every barber shop was doing merch. Every bars doing merch everywhere, you know. Yeah, and they were really came in the game offering what wasn't available prior to that, which was a good solid blank T-shirt, you know, blank hoodie. Well, it was very much marketed on American Apparel, but we'll do yes. it. You know, yeah. like even the labels look like American Apparel. Yeah, but then American Apparel was this thick stiff, carded cotton sort of garment, which ironically is now what everyone was selling, you know. <laughs> it's gone full circle. Everyone wanted a nice – it's about the hand feel. It's got a, a, feel. Lower, a lower neckline. Yeah, and it's got to feel good, the yeah. hand feel of the garment. But, um, yeah, now fast forward years later and it's like now people want carded cotton that stiff shit, you know. Well, 20-year cycles, man. That's how Everything it goes. Everything goes in cycles. You yeah. know, there'll probably come a time when I can see death by zero coming back, you know. But it became one of those things that was almost – you know, Ed, I remember nightclubs on Chapel Street. One person told me he was working them one day at a sign by the door, like, if anyone's wearing Ed Hardy or Death by Zero, <laughs> do not let them in the club. <laughs> well, yeah. They, uh, at, the, at the vineyard there, they had a sign that said Ed Hardy Free Zone. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And now I see kids getting around, and sometimes kids of all ethnicities, nationalities, colours, we're in Von Dutch. It's like, do you know the history of this bread? <laughs> yeah. But the, the Ed Hardy thing is so funny, man, because for a while, Having an Ed Hardy tattoo or inspired tattoo mm. was cool. Mm. Wearing Ed Hardy on your T-shirt, not cool. 
That's uh, fucking I, weird. I, you don't have any tribal Maori <laughs> tattoos on there, but I was going to say it's like that, man. They're back. They're, they're back. They're back, are they? Because remember, Robbie Williams was covered in it, and I was like, that was a cool look at a certain point in time. But then I was getting like, a tattoo. Oh. You know, Mick and Glenda, right? Yeah. I was getting tattooed at his tattoo sh- shop a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And you just and had him on here, didn't you? Just oh well, that was a few. That was early mm. days, but oh. yeah. And a girl there was getting a tribal tramp stamp, like so. And she would have been like nineteen. Yeah. So that shows you that that stuff is definitely back. Maybe Southern Cross tattoos might come back. You know, next. all these dudes are dusting them off. Yeah. Yeah. So man, we can talk about tattoos for a long time, and I end up doing that with a lot of tattoo artists. We don't need to. See, talk I about only that just yet. got my first like. I'm back two years in Greece and it was my daughter's name. I never thought I could commit to something because my taste is constantly evolving. It was always like, I'll get something and it'll be like, when I look back at the clothes that we used to do 10 years ago, like, I'll hate that shit now. So I always thought... Hold on to it for 20 years. I'm going to regret the tattoo, but yeah, eventually I was in Greece, Athens, and I, you know what, I just... I'm happy to have my daughter's name on there. Of course. And the tattoo thing Probably is... Probably once you start then. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, after you get past a certain time, I'll book in. I don't even know what I'm going to get. I yeah, just go, we'll do care. this. You don't care anymore, but that's just a different psychology. Well, I think the last one was Summer Jam. You know, we were there the uh, two weeks or three weeks ago. <laughs> you know, doing Summer Jam logo tattoos. Why not? It's a good weekend. My friend designed the logo. Yeah, hell, I'll Why sit not? down and get one. Yeah, that's it, man. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. So let's talk about you got Wanderer started, you got it into a few stores in oh, – it's interesting because WA is not usually where you would jump off normally. You'd think you'd start in Melbourne, but you had the foot in the door there. Yep. So that gives you the confidence to go and do a run. Then you get it into some smaller places in Melbourne. Uh, so we launched – no, we had all from the get-go. For the first range launched through that. That was our only sort of major chain in WA. But you've got to remember – Western Australia probably follows Melbourne culture a lot more. Yep. Sydney and Queensland are much more to their own. It's always thought it's funny, but in fashion you can almost divide it by football codes. So yeah. it's like New South Wales and Queensland are rugby states. They're coastal. They that's the style almost a little bit. Yep. And then you've got your AFL states, and them for the AFL states, Melbourne's the mecca. Yeah. So everyone in Perth, and this was at the time of the mining boom. You know, the stuff was going crazy over there. Kids were cashed up. But they looked. Everyone looked at Melbourne as the mecca. So if it was out of Melbourne, it was cool. You wanted to come to Melbourne to shop. You wanted to come to Melbourne to eat. You know. Same with Adelaide, I'm guessing as well. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know, that's always been a shit show. <laughs> There's been yeah, multiple clothing chains that have come out of there and globalize. We used to sell to, which was you mentioned GSE the other day. So Graham Street Elite was like a little subdivision of Mickey Six because yeah. globalize was a big chain out of Adelaide. They wanted Mickey Six, but we couldn't sell it to them because we already were in Edge and the other mm, stores. Territory lots, sort of thing. A lot of these stores are side by side to one another. So they're like, well, why don't you just give us the same product but do it under a different name? So that's how Graham Street Elite came about. It was literally a sub-label just for Globalize. Yeah. I remember, man, remember back in the day Propaganda, that clothing store? Yep, well, that, that was another one. Yeah, was, but that was when we were kids, though, man. Submerge, I think it was. There was another one, Submerge. Again, it was Adelaide based, but yeah, all the ones that have popped up and gone to big numbers from Adelaide have all ended up a shit show in the end, crashed and burnt. Yeah, and fucking does does General Pants still exist? That's yeah, they're still going. I mean, it seems to get sold every other year. Right, and they're probably one that, that was the hyper store back in the nineties. Like, remember on Chapel Street, you had Dakota Five Hundred One, mm-hmm. and General Pants quite nearby to one another. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of seen as the pinnacle of where you could shop for your pants and denim and everything. But that was they the, probably struggled to keep up with the times. I think you know the glue came out and glue went bigger and be, better than them. And now Universal Store probably even again. Yeah. And then Culture Kings entered the market, took a huge chunk of that with the streetwear sort of business. Yeah. And kids are swinging back to it. You know, more sport. Foot Locker's having a good time. JD Sport rolls into the country, and they probably just at the right time because that whole culture popping off in Western Sydney. The SHA sort of look and culture, JD. You think of JD Sport, and that's that's their customer. You know, what? Yeah. what how would you? It is. It's picture, very picture English-ish. A, yeah. Picture a JD a a JD, JD yeah. Sport shopper. He's in a tracksuit with a bum bag and, and uh, Air Max ninety fives. Yeah, that's what I think of straight yeah. away. Not TNs. I think that's more of your. No, well, they can't even get TNs. No. Foot Locker's the home of TNs in Australia. They yeah, them exclusively. I think that was the whole thing. Wasn't it that Nike wanted uh, that Foot Locker wanted a, a Nike Air? Max that, and they said well, we'll we'll get one designed just for us, and that's how the whole TN started. Like it's almost an exclusive for Foot Locker. Yeah, possibly. I mean, they just turned twenty five as well. The TN shoe, which is freakish to think that in yeah, ninety nine. 
You see dudes walk down the street in like when we're talking about earlier <laughs> when people all wear the same t-shirts. Yeah. It's not uncommon to see a group of 10 dudes and they're all wearing TNs. No. No. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I don't own a pair. <laughs> no, you never crossed over. I've ne- I don't know. I've just never been. I own probably, I'd say, 40 to 50 pairs of shoes. Oh, well, you're more than me. No. Mm. Oh, yeah. I don't wear most of them. And yeah. I've never owned a pair of TNs. So it's just not really my thing. Yeah. It's a look. You've got to be able to pull it off. <laughs> it's just not my thing. Yeah. But it's now it's funny that whole sort of like you said Esha fashion. You see kids now they're like ten years old and they're like got the bum bag, got the tech flea stuff, got the TNs on, like but so they're doing it real young. So why are the old guys that are like forty still doing it? It's kind of weird how it's crossed over. Normally with fashion it'd be like once the kids start doing it, the other people will grow out of it. Yeah, so is that part of it? Maybe you are just worried at your age in your forties wearing TNs. Yeah, I just stick to what stick to what I know. I wear Yeah, what, well that's it. We can wear Jordans, you know, because it's a throwback to our youth, you know. Jordan was the aspirational shoe of the 90s. I remember, well, actually, the first one for me was Reebok Pumps. Remember when Pumps came out? I had like, the D Brown ones. Yeah. That was like the first shoes I just remember begging my parents, like, I need to own these shoes. Yeah. I must own a pair of Reebok Pumps. And then the poor kids at school that ended up with the fucking Scorch Pumps and then <laughs> and everyone would pick on them. That was a pretty shitty time, yeah. man. <laughs> From Speeds down on Bay Street, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me, though. I had the real ones. <laughs> um, I think I got given my first pair, actually, hand me down from a mate. Because when you go to family of three, you get to sh- take in a shop at Clark's for yeah. shoes. So Aerosport was about well, the, you know, the, the yeah. highest way you could get. Whereas a mate whose parents, they owned a massive Captain Snooze store and he was an only child. So he got whatever. <laughs> whatever I bet you he had the fucking race car bed as well, did he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was what I always wanted, man. Yeah. My nan was like, one day if I win the lottery, you get a race car bed. I'm like, come on. Mm. Now we're at the point where we just buy our kids whatever they want. <laughs> once Wanderer starts and then once you start to th- – that, that period of time starts happening, uh, which you didn't have in your previous brands, you've got to start thinking about social media and that's definitely like Instagram has to be – you can't neglect it, can you? No, no definitely. It was sort of the fake it till you make it strategy. So we thought, you know, let's present our best foot forward. Let's act like we're a big brand, you know. That's a – so much of what, yeah, anytime you're aspiring to be something, just imagine you're already there, you know. I think that's a big part of having that mindset. So we just, all right, let's budget for photo shoots. Let's put on good models. Let's try and actually perform like we are one of these top brand, big brands, you know. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, we didn't really have an online strategy, I guess, because my background had come so much from the wholesale game. We were more focused on the stores and that was so much the old way, of, you know, I think we were saying before, like, you get kids to go down Greville Street, or you go hunt out the 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 clothing stores were the gatekeepers of what was cool and what was not. They could actually pre Instagram. Oh, pre yeah, pre online shopping, pre Instagram. It was really you had to get it past the buyer. You had to convince the store owner they needed your brand. If they put it in and it sold, you'd do more business, and that was really the metric of what was hot and what wasn't. But now. And that's where clothing stores are struggling to keep up. There's, I think we talked about it when we we're walking back today from the brewery, that there's brands out there and they clothing stores can't stock them. Mm. And they, they, these guys aren't even interested in the wholesale game. Yeah, that's not I, even on their radar. So, it, that, I mean, that's similar to musicians, rappers, and stuff that I talk to here. Yeah. They don't need record labels. No, we can, Certain you, you brands can ta- don't can, need retail. No, you can engage directly with your clientele, your fan base, your customer, you know, and that's where it's great for so many kids. You see starting brands these days. Yeah. You can engage directly. You can tell your story. So much of the whole wholesale side of things, you know, and I've seen it before. You sell to a clothing store. They've got the right brand. So you kind of like, yeah, it seems like it's cool. They've got X, this brand, this brand, X, Y, Z, you know, in, when you actually go to visit them in Newcastle, you see it and it's like, she looks like a shit show, you know, and your stuff <laughs> is not merchandised well. It's, you know, jumbled up on the racks. Whereas so much of it these days through TikTok and Instagram, you can really tell your own story and, and through pop-ups, activations. That's how yeah. kids are going about it, you know. But so I there's guess- never been a better time like that. You know, when we started to go to China, there was no yellow pages of factories that you could look up or anything to get a supplier in China and work out where do I get caps made, where do I get hoods made, where do I get this. There was none of that. You yeah. had to go through a connection. So we Pete from Jack and Jean, after we'd finished up at Shire and he'd sort of gone back to the store there, I launched Wanderer. I approached him again, said, "Would you be able to take us? You know, if we flew you over to Hong Kong with us, would you be able to come along and maybe introduce us some connections there in Hong Kong and over in Guangzhou?" And that's how we got. Our supplier who we still work with to this day and he's actually melbourne based chinese guy mark 
But um, he's only got the one client really he deals with, and that's Globe. So the Hill Brothers, he does all Globe's manufacturing, a lot of Stussy, a lot of Extra Large, and lives off that. And Wanderer. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So And that was, that was a part uh, aspirational thing that, all right, Stussy was one of the pinnacles, you know, where you saw a brand that was doing some big numbers and also a bit, a bit of a cultural icon. Um, okay, our stuff's going to be coming out of the same factory as that. That's cool. Yeah, well, you <laughs> but know, it's an interesting thing here where Stussy, the only country in the world where it's actually licensed is Australia. Every other country in the world, it's ran by the US and that contract finishes in June or July this year. So with it's Globe. With Globe. So it's all coming to an end. So there's going to be no more locally designed produce Stussy for the Australian market. It'll go to the American product, which is far more boutique. So you know in Sydney along Oxford Street, there's the passport store and there's a Stussy mm-hmm. store next door and you've got supply just next to it in that little sort of square. That store is the only store that sells American Stussy and that's owned by the, the American flagship company and the guy, that's Sean, who owns supply store. So that's... That does happen from time to time with those mm. sort of sort of uh, deals that people have done, but mm. I guess that is going to be interesting to see where Stussy goes because it has had a resurgence and there's young mm. kids now that are rocking eight ball t shirts and stuff like it's yeah. really come full circle. There, there was a famous story about um, G Star. Remember G Star was like the have to have Gene at a certain point in time. Yeah. Around that period, we're talking when Stevie was big and Travesty yeah. and Mickey Six. G Star was like the hot Gene on Chapel Street, and it was. 15 different panels of denim and they'd sell for 320 bucks, you know, for a pair of jeans. And we're talking 15, 20 years ago. That was a lot of money back then, but you had to have them. And guys were convinced, you know, that it was the hot jean to wear. Girls looked at guys like, hey, he's in G-Star. And that whole thing came about. I think it was Ron Walker's who runs the Grand Prix. His daughter was one of the people running the retail, but the distribution was all done over this handshake. So apparently one of the guys from G-Star got on a plane flying to New York or somewhere and boarded it with this Aussie and they were seated next to each other in business class and by the time they got off the flight at the other end over a handshake, they'd done this deal that, okay, you're going to be the Australian distributor for G-Star wow. and they rolled out stores and, you know, did some ridiculous, ridiculous numbers. Glue store, which is probably, you know, the pinnacle of what Sydney, they've overtaken probably where General Pants is, but the pinnacle of Sydney sort of street fashion or multi-brand fashion store. That's what they built the business on. It started, you know, just with a couple of doors and they were selling diesel and G-Star jeans and you hear the stories are selling thousands of pairs a week at $300 each pair. So you do the numbers. It's yeah. huge. Even if you look at that from a wholesale perspective, you halve it, you know, say it's 140 or whatever, it's still big yeah. bucks. Oh, yeah, <laughs> huge. Big bucks. Huge. Um, so, man, I'm losing my chronological train of thought here. <laughs> Where are we going? With we're the, dads. You we're know, da- yeah, yeah, this happens. Um, so, Not too sleep deprived these days, though. They're kids at least in a decent sleeping schedule. Or are you still paying for your? No, no, no. He's all right. He goes to sleep. He just, you know, it's like, Dad, yeah. yes, Dad, yes. And you say, like, Fuck, give me a break for a second. <laughs> um, anyway, no one wants to hear about our kids. Nah, that's um, another podcast, the Dad Life. That's, that's Scotty, Scotty Hines the other day. Yeah. He's like, We should do a Dad he's one. In the, he's I'm in like, the thick of it. Yeah. Yeah. Early stages. It'd be six months. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, he's got, he's, he's, one's a bit older, I think, but uh, potentially, yeah, he might have some more. Um, uh, all right, so let's go. Let's get back on the chronological journey of yeah. you and Wanderer as the brand. So then, Instagram, you're going to have to try and that, that's something that with you're coming in at the right time, I guess. For like, there's other brands that probably just don't adapt to that, but you you see this as an opportunity. Like, if we get the right models, if we get the right upcoming people, because you've had a lot of people that probably aren't models, but you've got them wearing the gear. Yeah. Like Mogwai a few weeks ago, he's like, "I'm not a model, man." Yeah, but boy, I'm like, Mason. <laughs> yeah. So then, like, you've and got- look, definitely in the early stages, I remember I was seeing Glue in Sydney, and I walked out. They were based right under Sydney Harbour Bridge. I had a meeting with them at the Rocks at their office there and when I walked out, oh, do you want to kick on? Yeah, we'll go for a beer, we'll go grab some dinner with the buyers because I'd had a long relationship with them. So I met Johnny, the guy from Glue, who still heads up the menswear. He started the Darling Harbour store and now to this day he's still with the company, been there 20 years, he's now the menswear director. And on that first trip to Berlin, um, I remember Pete said to me one night, it was about 12 o'clock and we're finishing up in a bar somewhere and Dan from Diesel Dan he said, oh, I'm going to kick on to this after party. You want to come? Pete looked at me and said, mate, if I give you one tip with Fashion Week or these sort of weird <laughs> events, take the long ride home. Stay out. I'm going to go home because I'm in, he was bordering, I think he just entered his 60s by that stage. He's like, I'm 60 plus years old. I'm going to go home to bed to the hotel, but you should go out with Dan. 
And eventually I found myself in like East Berlin in some bar by the river in the old communist part of town and was in some red, some velvet booth and, you know, lit up with red lights and everyone's on acid and I look over and I ask one guy, what are you doing? He's like, I'm the menswear buyer for David Jones. What do you do? I'm the menswear buyer for Glue. I was like, shit, I'm in this little power booth here. And we got talking and that was one of those moments where he's like, we don't, do we stock death buys here in Australia? We don't, do we? And you're over here in Berlin cutting up, man, we need to get you into the store. So. Yeah, I, uh, I think I just jumped around then. But um, <laughs> so with Glue, I was walking out after showing them one of the Wanderer collections and we went out, you know, because we had that relationship, we sort of, all right, let's go out, kick on for dinner and everything. And next thing, my phone just started blowing up. I'm getting missed calls, text messages, ding, 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 ding. I think something's going on. Check in case it's not a family emergency, mum or a sister calling you or something. But it turns out 360 was on the, pa- the project and they were interviewing him and he was sitting there wearing Wanderer, you know. Yeah, and so the phone was going nuts, and that was a little bit of a big moment, you know. And do you see do you see followers spike there? Do you see sales spike, or uh, it's just yeah? Oh, I'd probably following and, and brand recognition and everything. It was similar in the early days with Rule. I think you know my mate Nathan managed him from the get go. Mm-hmm. Rule, we did some photo shoots sort of before he popped off. Yep, and even I think recently three hundred and sixty was still wearing some Wanderer stuff in a new jacket or something. Probably, probably got to send him some new stuff. Send him some new stuff, man. I want to, I want to get him on here. I really want to get him on here. I don't think anybody has uh, had such an interesting story in Aussie hip hop as he has. From that fucking like, obviously he put in the work, mm. but he hit some. I don't know who else has been on. As the far front. as a solo artist, I mean, you had Hilltop Hoods and yeah. Bliss and Esso, which really he was on sort the cover of, of Rolling Stone, man. Yeah. They really blew up to a ridiculous level, but that was that crew sort of thing, whereas he was probably the first solo superstar, yeah. you know, to really reach that sort of level and cross over to the pop market with to that pop, song. To pop, go pop hard, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting now he's back doing the, like he obviously had a hiatus for whatever reason, which I'd love to talk to him about, but mm. uh, yeah, now he comes back and he's doing the rural tours and he's back to sort of where he started and he's kind of climbed that ladder again, man. Yeah, well, you yeah. know. When you get to that point at the top, that's that, that's the hard thing in fashion, you know. Once you hit the top, there's only one way from there. Yep. So you, you've got to reinvent. You've got to find what's next and what's the next path you're going to take. Mm. You guys have had been, with the marketing and like your social media obviously have been following for a while. You are pretty good at p- picking people that aren't necessarily models and then using them like you've had Melbourne and a lot of other people, even the, some of the females mm. aren't models obviously. They're, no, no. they're people that are interesting. You've got DJs, a lot of, you know, rappers, that sort of thing is but pretty I, cool. I've always been attracted to talent. I like – and that's not to shit on models, but, uh, you know, when you shoot with a model, I suppose, and it's such a small industry here or scene that you can shoot with some guy who might be signed to Chadwick's or Vivian's, one of the top modelling agencies, but they'll be doing Wanderer one week and then next week they're doing Cotton On and Target campaigns. You're like, this, this isn't street. This isn't the – I wanted authenticity in yeah. a brand. I thought you have to live and die by the sword. You have to – rep and be what your morals are about and that's I think one of the first cam- the very first campaign I think we did we shot Ivan Ooze mm-hmm. and I'd just seen him a week before and I'd been to the Wu-Tang concert and uh, you know I think he opened for them that night and then later on in, in the encore they they brought him back out and he's on stage there with Ghost and Meth and Raekwon rapping I'm like man I've got to get this kid on so you know shot him a DM pretty quickly he was jumping on one of the first campaigns and that was always it was like I'd rather shoot people with talent. I find talent an interesting story, and probably see my you got on here. You know, yeah. hopefully. Have you have you, you seen see interesting what people? Have you seen what he's doing now? He's doing yeah, the like, cooking thing. The cooking uh, thing blown up. Yeah, man. Dean sent it to me the other day. He goes, "You see what uh, I have news is doing now? Like four hundred thousand yeah. people watching him and his missus pick a song and then cook to it." I think he just launched that pre Christmas or something. It's like seven hundred fifty k followers or something Crazy, ridiculous. Man. But he's clocked social media. He knows. But yeah. you know, he knows. is he still doing music? Not too sure. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Not too sure, but yeah. Um, yeah, and then you've had Melbourne. He did some stuff for you as well. Yeah. He's a good dude. We always he? got our ear to the floor. So Moses, Tactics, you know, anyone coming up in the scene, obviously we want to shoot and we want to represent Melbourne. Mm-hmm. It was probably challenging in the lockdown in 2020. Um, that's where we found we just couldn't get out and do photo shoots. I mean, some brands were still just guerrilla it and you know, getting away with it. We got to a point where we started sending samples up to Sydney because Sydney wasn't in lockdown and I got crew there. Yeah. So I'd just send it to photographer friends of mine and they'd book models up there. So we shot with Spanion before he sort of popped off at the real early stages Future. of him. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. And I remember, man, early days when you first started launching, you'd always, every year you'd do like a mixtape 
with uh, different DJs yeah, yeah. to put that together. That was sick. You're not doing that anymore? Oh, it's just hard because do people even listen to mixtapes these yeah. days, you know? I don't know. Uh, we had Mafia on board, Hijack, 86. And 86 look, we still yeah. get that crew together every year for the Wanderer Christmas, annual Christmas party at Section 8, which yeah. is where we launched the brand mm-hmm. uh, in 2000, February 22nd. Uh, 20 and 2016, we had the launch party with MJ and a whole 100, 100% fat team. So 86, uh, Flagrant, shout out my boy, Hijack, eh, all that crew. So Section 8's always sort of been because of that, we had the launch there, a little bit the spiritual home of Wanderer. Yeah. And every year, you know, just before Christmas, we have a Christmas party. I've been uh, on MJ's case for a long time to come on the show and he doesn't drive, so can you bring him down here? No, I could have brought him down straight, from the, straight from the dinner last night, you actually. If I'm, if I'm slightly dusty, it's because I was, yeah, no, a couple of glasses of red and pizzas at S- SPQR. Which is, uh, which is Tommy Tom Showtime's Showtime. joint, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, I've never been, man. Nah, it's great pizza, really good, yeah. authentic. Uh, let's get MJ. I'm going to make him. Yeah. You're going to bring him down here one day. All right. Yeah. All right. Maybe next summer. We'll, we'll leave it for a bit. Nice warm day. We'll get him down here. Perfect. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. Um, let's talk about, so you've had some success in chains by this stage, trying to get mm. back to the chronological thing. Yep. There are some bigger retailers that you kind of, I guess that's the only way you can really go from where you are when you're in every major streetwear chain in each city, every mm. big one. So then Culture King starts happening. Then that there's an opportunity to work for them. How does that sort of come about? Or work oh, with them, look, I the, the game, The game changed dramatically from when I left Shy Clothing in those Death by Zero days. Uh, you could take a clothing brand to a store and show them and then, if they thought it was different, they fucked with it. Yeah, it's unique. You know, I like the style. I think this is retail. I think it's going to sell. They put it on. Now that's completely different. Now you have to blow it up on social media before you get in the store. A store's not going to look at touching it. Chicken them. or the egg sort of thing. Yeah, store's yeah. not going to look at touching it in this current day and age unless it's already something on social media. So it's almost like your strategy and change. You wouldn't go out to a retail store and try and launch how we did through wholesale, you launch online, you make a name for yourself. And I think I saw something with like Simon from Culture Kings the other day. He said, you do that and that's when we come knocking on your door. And they would say that, you know, with the counts you want to get, they'll come to you. It's almost like, yeah, if you've got to chase or if you've got to chase them there, they're not the ones. You don't want to door knock too much, I get that. Yeah. No, but you have to, you know. Yeah. We've I'd sent clothing boxes, you know. I've spent weeks driving around Sydney, cold calling on every shopping centre in the early days, um, dropping off boxes of clothing, sometimes sending it to the owners of the stores, whatever you could do just to get your product in front of people. Yeah, and then sometimes I'm guessing you're giving these guys stuff and then next time you go back to see if they want to reorder, they're not even fucking there. No. Nah. It's in that sort of crazy retail time. No, nah, and look, the clothing game's volatile. Like I've seen in our second year with Wanderer, that clothing chain in WA that I uh, spoke about and one of the guys who mentored me, they went into administration and they owed us $80,000. So literally, uh, you know, they say in a business, a lot of them, you, when you sort of get that incremental growth and especially you drop off your first range and it's all on terms to store. So by the time you get paid for that, it's 30 to 60 days later, you're dropping off your next delivery by that stage. So it takes quite a while to actually start seeing the money coming, flowing out Chasing of it. You're, re, you're reinvesting all that money in the early days. And they say often in 18 months, you're lucky if you're drawing a wage, you know, in the first 18 months. Well, we were sort of two years in. And this clothing chain in WA fell under and it was $80,000 they took us for, you know. Wow. And you didn't get any of that. Well, the nah, liquidation you get I've seen a lot over the years. Edge, when we were at Shy, when I was at Shy Clothing, then they had us $400,000. i have seen some huge, huge bankruptcies. But it's part and parcel of doing business in the rag trade and that's the problem is that it's on terms, you know. Guys, these people these days sort of are direct to market and it's amazing because, as I said, you can tell your brand story. You can engage directly with your consumer. Mm. You can really be unique and hone down on what it is who you are as a brand. And I see some of these brands like, oh, man, we want to get into wholesale now. <laughs> like wholesale is hard because you've got to sell them so far out. You've got to curate the range. You're fighting for shelf space in there. And then when the shit hits the fan, you don't get paid. You're, yeah. chas- you're constantly chasing for money, you know. That's... And that was experience at Shy Clothing and here. Is like I got in this game to design and sell clothing because that's what I love and you end up becoming a bank. <laughs> Dude, in any business, yeah. 
I don't like paperwork. In any business you get into, you're going to have to do it. Nah. And in small business, the whole the shit thing is most of what you're doing is chasing people for money yeah. who are then chasing and other you, people for you, money. And you don't want to be that guy because you nah. build a great relationship with these people <laughs> and, you know, you ride the waves with them. And that that riding the waves means you've got to be there for the down times as well as the good times because in the good times, they're throwing money at you, they're placing refill orders and in the bad times, they're saying, man... Business has been tough, you know. Yeah. People aren't coming through the door at the moment. Hey, can I push this bill back a month? You know, cool, what we've got to do. Yeah. So in hindsight, when something like the opportunity to work with, well, to sell out of uh, Culture Kings comes along, in hindsight, was that a bad move or just a let, like a, just a time that you thought, we gave it a go, was it for us? Uh, look, at the time it was big, you know. We threw a launch party. They went back with them on the Queen Street store before they moved onto mm-hmm. Russell Street where they are now, back and onto Hosey Lane. And, you know, that was the go-to store at that point in time. So, you know, it was big and they were, I don't think they were really stocking many Australian streetwear brands. And so that's quite unique and that's, you know, mm. you've got to stop because I think when you're stuck in a business mode, every day you're putting out spot fires, every day you're fighting with what you have to do. So sometimes it's nice to actually just stop for a moment and just... And I remember that being one of those moments early on in the first couple of years of Wanderer where all my crew turned up, Flagrant dj Mafia dj Rui dj in there, and you sort of stopped and went, hey, this is pretty fucking cool, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. There's all these American hype streetwear brands and here's my shit hanging up next to it and we're in what's seen as the pinnacle of Australian streetwear. You know, more recently, Foot Locker, they were one uh, at the start of last year. We got into there and, you know, it's a store I've shopped in since I was a kid. Foot Locker was the go-to. It's the OG sneaker store, you know. Before sneaker culture was cool, Foot Locker was always been, you know, yep. the dope store. And we were the first Australian brand that actually cracked the doors there, you know, to get in. And when I, re- I had a recent meeting with them in Brisbane just only a month ago and they said they actually tried and tested a few other little Australian brands and they said, yeah, it didn't work, so you're the only one we're actually running on with. As I said, it's those little moments, you know, when you're in a small business, you have to sort of stop and pinch yourself. Or the other week, I didn't even realise until I got into work and checked my Facebook memories. And I'm never on Facebook these days, but saw, ah, oh, eight years ago today was the launch party. I went, holy shit. <laughs> I've marked it in the calendar now, so I don't forget February 22nd. But, yeah, if it wasn't for the Facebook memory, I wouldn't have sort of remembered it. And that's went down memory lane and started looking at photos so when I lost my job at Shy Clothing and was launching Wanderer, I'd actually started to renovate downstairs in my house and midway through that, lost my job. So you can't complete the renovation. So my house for a state of about 12 to 18 months was just a building site downstairs, like concrete, everything ripped out. And looking back, it's like I had a milk crate and a little table and my computer set up there. And it was like, that's how, you know, I put the brand together and, and now you've come this far. Yeah, yeah. And there now you go. You're full <laughs> there you go. There you go. As I said, you've got to sometimes stop and yeah, take those moments in because in any business, doesn't matter what you're doing, you're always sort of focused on the day to day grind and the day to day hustle. And yeah, it's good to appreciate look how far you've come sometimes. Do you find that when you do get stocked in some of those bigger retailers that the smaller ones then go, well, come on, man, you're getting too big. We can't really look at you as an independent brand, which essentially that's what you are at the end of the day, you know? Oh, yeah, probably not much really. I mean, I think over the whole course of Wanderer, we've only ever lost maybe one or two accounts and maybe that was down that path. Probably skate, mm. <laughs> you know, when we're starting out, it was like we just got stocked in a couple of little skate stores and they were saw us as like, yeah, cool, it's an independent brand from Melbourne, you know, doing its thing. And then once they see you, it's like, oh, now you're in Culture Kings and you're in Glue and Universal. But you're not Culture Store. Kings anymore for the no. record. <laughs> no. Because I know a lot of the viewers don't like Culture Kings, no, which I'm not a fan I, of either. And I can see, yeah, you know, where that came, uh, where that comes from. I don't think – I thought the Queen Street store was dope and I thought the concept was dope when they, when, when, on, they had the, when they had the barber shop in there. Yeah, but it was Miami strip club vibes, you know. That was it. You, you walked in there with gave the loud anxiety. music. and gave me anxiety, man. Yeah, but I thought with the barber shop and everything, that was a good concept. And it was sort of for young kids, I'd see in school holidays, it was packed in there. My parents would bring their kids in, kids would get the train in. It was like that was a day out, you go get your – Get your hair fixed up, so you buy your outfit. On. I think moving to the new location where they are at Russell Street, which they had to, obviously, because the store the site was getting redeveloped into a hotel. But I think backing onto Hosier Lane and all that and how that's kind of sucked onto the culture hasn't necessarily been 
a great branding exercise and some of the things that have happened, like obviously where they've painted over people's artwork and then done biggie murals and all this to launch new products and then complain when someone's gone over it. Like, that hasn't been good, you know. Ah. Street culture is about fuck you, I'll do, I'll do what I want. You know, graffiti culture is about that and suddenly when you're you know, painting murals at the back of the store to promote your next two-pack collaboration with the estate of Tupac Shakur. Yeah. yeah. It's not... but man, It's any, a money grab. Any, and graphers don't, graphers don't look you know, kindly onto that sort of thing. Definitely not. But, like, from a, from a consumer... I'm just a consumer. I'm not in this business. But if I go into a shop and they need a forklift to get a hat down for me, then I'm in the wrong joint. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they go, dudes are in there, go... Let's see, I, I love retail. And in those years when I was travelling over in Europe, you know, we were constantly going into the department stores and looking at the retail spaces and how you're doing. It's impressive, you know. Like when you walk in, I'd it love is. to see the Vegas store. See, that's supposed to be what Melbourne is on steroids, you know. Which I, and, don't, and, I don't need to see that. <laughs> I would have, I'd have a panic attack, man. It's too much. Yeah, you know. But too much going on for me. It's, like, it's supposed to be the biggest hat wall in the southern hemisphere or something. They've got two forklifts. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> there you go. They probably do. Um, so <laughs> when you do get bigger, and I guess like you were saying earlier, it's a real kick when you see someone wearing your stuff when you're uh, when you're starting out. It's a bit mm. of a, you know, you're at whatever it was, summer days or something, you see people wearing your stuff. Mm. But as you become oh, that bigger... Was the, that was the opposite though. We looked out and we went, oh, holy shit, the whole crowd right. is, so you knew is wearing... It. Well, that's when we knew it was like we need to pivot and do something. Do something Start different. thinking of what's next. Yeah. You know, because there's so many guys were all in the same shit. And as I said, you walk down Chapel Street and see four guys walk past you and they were all in Death by Zero, which yeah. was cool because you were selling them that. And it's like, yeah. oh, I'm making a buck out of this, but at the same time, it's kind of weird. And you just can't imagine that these days. Like imagine going out with three mates for a beer down the brewery and the three of you all turn up in a Supreme T-shirt or yeah. a, a Wanderer T-shirt, t-shirt, whatever it is. Like that's weird. It, it, it is a bit weird. But now it seems to be something that you're good at posting on social media, not on the Wonder account but on your personal account oh, when yeah. someone, you know where I'm going, yeah, where someone will be on the news or something wearing your brand and that's... Well, there's both. I think you talk, you're talk. you alluding to. So <laughs> I used to share some of the more colourful messages. I had a lot of people saying, dude, there's a coffee, a coffee table book in this, you know. Like, yeah, it's just what was I saying? There was one, oh, I go to Geelong Grammar and, you know, I'm one of the coolest guys at school. If I say shit's hype, shit's hype. So you need to send me a free box of clothing or, you know, seeing guys in a string singlet sort of gut popping out like, hey, can I model for your brand? It would be my pleasure, you know. Really? Oh, you've had some colourful ones. Maybe that's died off a little bit. But, yeah, in the early days definitely we were getting hit up all the time with some very entertaining ones. So wannabe influencers? There, or there just- was one actually that sent us a thing that's like um, – I can make your brand the biggest thing in Shepparton. You know, I'm a guy, a car mechanic. And have you ever considered Wrangler? Wrangler and Wanderer both start with a W. Both have an iconic W. I could make your brand as big as Wrangler. What does that and even he was a mean? Me- oh, I don't know, but he was a mechanic in Shepparton. God bless. I mean, shout out if the guy's <laughs> a fan of the brand. I'm not shitting on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it was just almost the assertiveness of us. Like, uh, I can make your brand as big. And like, okay, I'm not sure how you're going to do that from Shep. But yeah. <laughs> Why not? Hey. Um. As I was saying before, you have to imagine it and envisage it, you know, and then maybe it comes. So, what about when you see your stuff on the news? Does that give you a kick? Well, it's generally down this way, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's oh, the, the insular peninsula or the ninch. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I'm guessing most of that's stolen from Bayside. I often track the package. Like when I see something, it's always Frankston. It's always fucking Frankston. <laughs> Funky town. It's funny how so much of my story connects back to there Frankston. through Pete and Jack and Jean and everything. But yeah. Um, it's always Frankston whenever someone's on the fucking news wearing Wanderer. I, I saw- <laughs> Getting arrested, security camera footage, drive-by, car theft, big W, highly identifiable. <laughs> and it's Frankston. Back, the and then prints. I track the product because I know we've got – Foot Locker sells our stuff in there and I think Edge and Neverland. So we're actually in three stores in, in Bayside Centre. But I can actually see, oh, what did Foot Locker buy? What did that store buy? What that buy? Like, okay, I know which store they got it from. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm like, that, yeah. Yeah. I had WA police contact us one time and that was after a big bikey sort of altercation or something and there was apparently someone was quite seriously injured and it was like the only clue we've got on security footage because these guys had masks but we could see quite clearly a Wanderer bum bag <laughs> one of the bikies was wearing. Really? And then you, but, but you're like, man, we stock this in 10 stores over there. How do we know? Yeah, I said that. You know, like yeah, we're, in, person couple, we're in a couple of chains over in WA. It could have been either of them, but yeah. 
For sure, man. You know. um, but when you hear something quite serious, like oh, I want to help the police, but also grab fuck the police, <laughs> you know. Like, I'm not, a, I'm not a bootlegger, but then <laughs> how serious was this injury? Was it between the bikies? Not between? No, okay. <laughs> I so I sent you one the other day when it was a, a dude wearing one of your t-shirts and then he was stapling his ear or something. On yeah, the, that, they seem to pop up on social media a bit as well, man. Which and is a few which like is that. Funny. Oh, there's yeah. the one with the guy trying to do a line off the phone. And yeah, that was <laughs> ages got, ago. Wasn't they got it? the photo of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, and that's probably been our guy a little bit. There's a loose unit out there, you know. He works hard during the week. He parties fucking even harder on the weekend, you know. And that's probably been our guy. That's yeah. Well, I guess every brand needs your 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 demographic. Mm. So it's better that there's people wearing it, having fun, getting pissed, whatever, than people wearing it and not doing fun shit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or at least they're wearing it. At least they're fun, <laughs> colourful. <laughs> Gives us good material. Actually, you got a friend Chad who's a graphic designer, and he's always at me. He's like, you need to do a like mugshot lookbook or a secure a CCTV. Lookbook, you should do a campaign that's all like shot through the security cameras, you know. Yeah, there you go. Not looking like it's the most wanted, Australia's most wanted type. <laughs> Why is it that those guys get done in your t shirts, or is it just that you notice it more because it's your probably side? notice it from us? But there was a certain period of time, remember, where Carl Williams and all that, when back in the underbelly days, they were all in Everlast. And every time you saw one of them walking out of a courtroom, it was always the big Everlast logos across the see. It's interesting that you mentioned Everlast because Everlast now is a Kmart brand, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now this seems so. It's Travis, Travis, he went in. Travis, he went in Target or Kmart. Target, yeah. yeah. And I remember when I did my toes in doing t-shirts years ago, and I you had it. Hold on, I'm learning new things here. Now I'll tell you about <laughs> it. I might have some t-shirts out the oh. back. I did have a have a. You, have, I reckon you owe me a couple of t-shirts. So <laughs> <laughs> it's about fucking time you gave one. But sent one this way. <laughs> I remember. I remember going to one of the printers and I saw Travis, the travesty guy, yeah. that in that in the peak. And I said to someone, and they're like, "Yeah, he'll never, he'll never sell out because he's making so much. He, it's his baby, blah blah blah." But you think I, those tees were selling for eighty dollars? Yeah, I know. There's a retail. So I was wholesaling mine for forty back then, yeah. but I wasn't. It was in like seven shops, right? Yeah. But you were at that point eighty bucks, and we're talking fifteen years ago. That's a lot of money. That's what I'm saying. When yeah. we started Wanderer, we were selling fifty dollar t shirts. Forty nine ninety five was like the price. The sweet spot, and even now, I think it's sort of it's gone up to sixty now. Yeah. What the sort of sweet spot? But that's what like I was saying. We we're talking about G Star before. The, those jeans entry level was two eighty. Three so, three twenty was your more engineered G Star jeans. Eighty dollars was a t shirt, and went fifteen twenty years ago. The people were paying those prices. Like thinking of that in today's terms, it's crazy. So I want to know more about this brand. <laughs> I'll tell you. Oh, about just it later. Uh, oh, you're back on the three thousand <laughs> podcast here with Kirby. Today we've got Maloney, streetwear brand owner. No, I, t- I tried years ago. I yeah. tried years ago. I'll tell you. Because you got a bit of a design background, don't you? Well, I studied graphic design for a couple of years. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I see really some dope little logo plays and stuff you've done. Because obviously, I'd... not only does my mother live in your old house, but obviously <laughs> we did share a workspace in St Kilda for a brief <laughs> period of time. We did indeed. We did indeed. Yeah. And then COVID happened, and then. Uh, I got out of there, man. Yeah. And was that pre-COVID when you got out? Yeah. Uh, of yeah. course, because everything I shut down. I moved down here and then, yeah, then every, yeah, yeah. It all went to shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, no one cares about me, man. I'm talking about <laughs> you. I'll go and try and find one of my T-shirts yeah, after. I want to see this. Show, yeah. Maybe I'll get my photo. Yeah, the the, the infamous 3,000 yeah. podcast photo. I'd still wearing one. Still wearing Wanderer. I can. Uh, You're wrapping What hard. was the brand called? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. I'll show you. Okay. It right. would have potentially been stocked in some of the same shops as less. Okay, as, we can edit. As, you can, not we. You can edit this bit out. Yeah, I'll edit a fair bit of it out. Not with Wanderer, but just in general, how they do end up having a life cycle and how those do those brands do end up in those sort of places. I've seen that a lot over the years, you know, as we were talking about some of the names we dropped, Stevie, Why Charlie, Travesty, none of them are around anymore. I think that's, that's going to be an interesting one now because the economic climate's very, very tough. 22 last year was a hard year, I think, for a lot of retail, a lot of brands, um, hospitality businesses. That so, COVID was a boom. I know maybe in your industry, which got completely shut down, that was, it was difficult. But for a lot of brands, which are online, it was boom days in COVID, yeah. you know, um, and they really rode this wave. And I think the the way people connect with, with brands, as we said, has changed. It's we used to seek them out by cool boutiques, by street press, by what you'd see other dudes out and about wearing. Now it's through TikTok and Instagram, you know. Mm. And that wave exploded, and COVID took a lot of micro things which are happening 
and accelerated them. It put the foot to the floor and sped that up in a huge way. So online shopping, people that would have never online shop before had to online shop because it was the only way they could still obtain products into their household, you know, when yep. and lockdowns, when shopping centres were closed and every non-essential thing were... And people are buying more casual clothes because they're staying at home. They're well, not going to it. work. Well, you know, track pants exploded. It became about sweats, sweat sets, and everything. Hoodies, you know. Now it's probably have pivot. Everything pivots. So now, as resort, well, resort wear was the biggest trend over the summer that's just been, which is like knitted shirts and that really sort of preppy linen linen shirt, knitted shirts, shorts. Mm. Everything goes through these cycles where it's. With the cool brands, and then it ends up going, and then once you see it at fucking, you know, Target, Kmart, you know that it's gone through the full cycle. Mm. But then from a brand like you that's trying. And it's, and it's evolution. You get probably young kids buy the thing stuff thing, at yeah. first, and then by the time the young kid turns up at family barbecue and sees the recently divorced uncle there and he's wearing that brand, it's like, oh, it that's... loses its cred. Yeah, he's dating a young girl or chasing some young girl. Like, suddenly it's not that cool anymore, you know, so they're on to the next thing. Yeah, and that's also an interesting sort of theory with brand identity and brand protection. You can have it on your own socials or who you distribute it to via stores. Mm. You've got control of, but you can't. You can't, can't control who, can't who control purchases. The it. end consumer. No, definitely. At the end of the day, the, the there's been a couple of times I've been walking down the street and you see someone in Wanderer and like, oh, shit, can I buy that t-shirt back <laughs> <laughs> off them? Here's a twenty. Give yeah. it back to me. Oh, I'll pay them full retail. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's pretty funny though, man. But I guess, uh, but that that keeps you evolving with what you're doing. And I guess you start to, if you've got an idea in mind with the way the brand's going, if you make yeah. stuff that isn't for that market, you don't want it to have, yeah. right? Maybe. Well, they, they call it the seven year itch in brands. And so, look, ninety five percent of clothing brands which start don't make five years. Oh, I think it's businesses in general. Any business that starts out, it's like. If you make five years, you're doing better than 90% of the other businesses because so many people have ideas and don't mm -hmm. go through or they find the reality of it's tougher than what it is or, you know, it might be selling some clothes and, and got a little bit of hype around it. It's like making no fucking money out of it and just living the life of a rock star, you know, going out, eating, drinking, shagging. That, if that's what you want to do, cool. But longevity is what's hardest in this game and I saw that with the other company with Shy Clothing where... You know, brands were almost seen as disposable by Michael, the owner. That's all right. We could kill that brand off, start the next one. And that's what some of the re major retailers are doing. So Culture Kings, obviously, you named. And some of the other stores, I can't even mention probably because I sell to them. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. they, they will see, all right, well, Skate's hot, so we'll create a skate brand now. And this Surf's hot, so we'll create a surf brand. And there's not seen longevity, so that's the hard thing. But we probably hit that last year with seven years, what you call the seven-year itch, where – all right, things need to be reinvented. So we changed our T-shirt fits. We moved to heavier weight cottons. We changed up our print um, and really re-engineered the ranges, how we were sort of selling it and telling it, our story. Is that been well received with the more – like I'm a 40-something-year-old guy? So. I think so, definitely. You know, we were constantly seeing with our online store we had the best year we'd ever had and that was in a tough, tough economic climate. Mm -hmm. But – you can't win every battle, you know. If you try to sell to everyone, you sell to no one. You, you got to at some point say, "All right, this is the customer we want." And to gain a new customer, often you have to lose an old one. Mm. That's just the reality of, of doing business. Is when someone new jumps on, and goes, "That shit's hot." Someone else is going to go, "No, nah, that I don't want that anymore." And hopefully, you know, hopefully, we how we pivoted and everything, and the results we saw. So last year, we were all right. We're doing the right thing. Yeah, man. And then, like, I guess with people who buy your product they're going to mature as well because like the 24 year old that buys well, that, that's it, you know seven years ago they're going to be 31 now they're more mature and they change you know they suddenly change. they're they're a dad you know they've got a mortgage and pushing a pram around on a weekend you know yeah prior to that they were in revs on a sunday morning well, you know? yeah I, I, I guess and then you've got your really big brands that may, manage to nail a whole different like a whole bunch of different demographics mm. with age you know like you've got your really big brands but that's a hard fucking thing to, to master yeah I and I mean, how many of them are there? And, and, and the game's changing. Like companies like Nike are feeling an international in this current climate. And I saw something the other day speaking to Simon from Culture Kings and he said, what wouldn't be one thing that would take down Nike? He said it would be death by a thousand cuts, you know. It's going to be – and like Wanderer, look at us, we're nothing compared to Nike. But we take a tiny little percentage of the market but there's 10,000 Wanderers out there, you know. Yeah. And if every one of them takes a tiny little piece of the pie, you know, that slowly starts eating into it. You know, and the, the sneaker culture, uh, you know, 
that's it. That's an interesting space where mm. obviously there was such an explosion of that through COVID. Everyone was shopping sneakers. There was low supply because the factories in China had shut down, the shipping channels, the supply chains had all shut down. So there was limited supply, but a customer there just lapping it up and frothing it because you were cashed up. You were sitting at home, even if you were, you know, out of work, you were still on uh, JobKeeper or whatever it was. And you were I can't just, remember yeah. what it was called, but yeah. You were, everyone was shopping ridiculously. And now, Suddenly, supply chains have caught up. Nike's pumping out Dunks, TNs, Air Max Ones, Jordans. These shoes, which you couldn't walk into a Foot Locker or a JD Sport and pick up mm-hmm. two years ago, you could walk into them right now and you've got the choice of all of them and probably multiple colorways. Yeah. And suddenly, all right. So, I mean, the, the Are stores, they flooding the market, do you think? I think so. there's just definitely a degree of that, but you know. Where there, there's probably a little bit of lack of innovation, like the Jordans. You know, he stopped playing with what we say '97. Yeah. TNs are 25 years old. Mm. Like hipster kids, cool kids are wearing Crocs and New Balances these days. Yes, yeah, Sol- and there was a time when New Balances, Asics, that, Solomon, a lot of those. Uh, but, yeah. 100%. There was a time when New Balance was the daggy dad shoe. Remember, you know, mm. it's kind of like that if you're in your 30s and you know. You know, New yeah. Balance has been around since 1906. Wow. I made a trivia question not long ago, but yeah, that's been, that, it's been, it's longer than a lot of those other footwear brands, pretty much all of them. Yeah. But it's sound, because it's got the I almost wore my new balance today, but I threw on the J's because I knew you you're, you're a Jordan man. <laughs> Jordan man, I got my dunks on. Yeah. Um, with these cycles of fashion and everything seems to go through a cycle, we've got to be due to get the late 90s back, which is coming back now, but it's not coming back for people like us, it's coming back for the younger generation. Mm. So we're not the ones wearing the 90s stuff. The younger kids are wearing the 90s stuff, which is a bit of a fucking oh, well, look, I just bought my first pair of straight leg jeans, you know, in quite a while. And in the 90s, man, the baggier, the bigger, the better. But you get to some point, uh, you know, yeah. 43, it's like... You know, I was watching that clip with Mason the other week. Of you two talking? I mean, didn't you mention like Andre three thousand or something? And it was like, yeah. who wants to be a fifty? Who wants to hear a fifty-two-year-old guy rap? You know, it's kind of like, yeah, that was what our scene, and that's what we wore and everything. But uh, at some point, I do have to dress my age. Who wants to hear a fifty-two-year-old guy play that. the I, flute? <laughs> yeah, I say that in baggy jeans and Jordans. But you, know. you got to stay on. You got to stay on the on the on the fringe. Yeah, but I'm Steezy. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Steezy Steve. Steezy Steve or Stevie Wanderer. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. I've never made that connection. Yeah. Um, so but this is another thing, though. That with with this sort of fashion industry, you've got to have to stay on top of what's going on because you've got to be designing it now, mm. producing it in a few months to then. We're in the end of summer. So you're th- – okay, so just so to break it down, we're in March now. Yep. So what we, are you we, working we, we, on now? De- we've designed all product for this year. So we next design that we'll be doing would be working on January, February, March for next year. 2025. Yep. Right. Essentially, so yep. you're 12 months ahead. Uh, yeah, about nine months generally. I mean, yeah. we're, we're in March, so yeah, about nine months. So how do you forecast that sort of stuff? You just look at what, it, what you think is going to come, what other people – of a, a, a wearing in other parts of the world which might pop off, but you don't want to levitate too much away it, from what you do. It used to be because the world was slower. Like people used to do big buying trips, I suppose. Um, all the major retailers, their buyers would go over to trade shows or go shop New York, LA, Amsterdam, London. The world moves so much faster these days because what's happening on the street in London right now, kids are seeing on TikTok and five, ten minutes later, and you, know, you almost don't have seems so redundant these days. It's like mm. it's just a junket basically for a company. I mean, if, if you work for Meyer or David Jones and they're happy to fly you around to those places, I say fucking go for it. Why not? But, yep. you know, I don't believe you really have to. That You can see what's happening in the culture and everything starts small and then we're probably more on the mainstream side of things. So, you know, it takes a little while for an Australian consumer or guy to get it, but it's definitely quicker. We used to be seasons and seasons behind and that's probably not the case now. And there's more diversity. You just got to look around at the face of Melbourne these days. You know, it's not the the faces you see walking into a place these days aren't what the faces ten years ago, twenty years ago. You know, mm. and with that, it's been different consumers, different looks, different different vibe. Do you think what like a, do you think that with all this sort of uh, vintage fashion that's happened, which has definitely changed the cut of T-shirts, like you're saying, they're more boxy now. Mm. Is that going to continue? Because I start to see mainstream places are selling shirts that look like they're vintage fucking Bulls championship shirts. Has that killed that whole vintage vibe off, do you think? Oh, when Cotton On starts to exactly. it as well, like, yeah. you, know, you know? And that was a huge one, I think, for that whole American football sort of look, you know? 
everyone, you know, Mitchell and Ness were selling all these T-shirts into Culture Kings and premium sorts of stores and next week Culture uh, Cotton On licensed it and, you know, suddenly you can get all that licensed merch in there. Now, they've got, they're selling two-pack T-shirts yeah. at Kmart. Yeah. But the vintage thing isn't going to go away because I think the next big thing in fashion, sustainability has become, become a big issue, you know. Mm. Fashion is one of the biggest, you know, polluters worldwide. It's one of the biggest drain on resources. I think they've read that the fashion industry outweighs, you know, global transportation, so shipping, planes, cars worldwide, the fashion industry pollutes more. There's going to be more of a push into that. It's what sustainable sort of cottons, ethically produced and, you know, products that last. The fast fashion thing was really a bad thing to happen in a sense yeah. with the explosion in online brands and probably more female-oriented than orientated than male. But it's just... And, again, social media is to blame as well because you used to wear a top to a party. If none, of, you could go to a party next week. It was a different set of friends. None of them had seen that top. Now you've posted the photo on the gram. Oh, <laughs> Everyone's seen that so top. Much. So then the party you go to the next week is like suddenly. Well, probably maybe it's not a big thing for girls. Uh, sorry for guys, but for girls, girls. definitely. They're like, well, I can't wear that dress again. You yeah. Know? But that's that's encouraged this whole fast fashion. Throw, you know, wear it once, throw it in the bin, or sell it. And I don't think that's sustainable long term, no. especially in the world we live in, where you know it's a finite finite resources and people are. The generation that's coming up now, they're connecting with brands in a different way. They're sh shopping in a different way, you know. I remember online shopping, there was people, oh, I don't want to trust putting my credit card details into a computer, yeah, you know. Dumb, yeah. Kids these days, it's not on the fucking radar. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I don't sure. trust doing that. Like, growing up with online shopping, growing up with TikTok, growing up with Instagram, that's yeah. how they're connecting. I really like what uh, homie brand's doing with their, like, reborn stuff. So they'll mm. get other things and they'll chop them up. And I think that, that, that like, obviously there's a up, lot up of... Upcycling. Upcycling, yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of legwork in that stuff, and I understand there's a lot, like that, you know, that you're manufacturing things essentially twice. But that's cool that things have a second life, and yeah. and and they're not just going to get discounted. They're like, we're going to upcycle this, and that could, I think, is definitely a trend where it could be going. That sort yeah, of definitely, stuff. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I was in Newtown in Sydney the other week when we were up saying glue and shoe uh, shoe grab, and you know, we went down. So Oxford Street is probably not what it used to be as far as fashion wise. Newtown. It's become a bit more of the hub, and when you're walking down there, the stores that were busiest were the vintage stores. You know, so many of the branded retail spaces were just had tumbleweeds blowing by them, and one staff member standing around looking un uh, uninterested. And you walk past a vintage store, and there's 30, 20, 30 people in there just digging through. You know, and I ran in and found myself an old blur t 1990s tour t shirt. Sure. And like, Park life, fuck yeah, this is my jam. <laughs> but that's that's it eighty because bucks. <laughs> the kid, yeah, the kids are more more uh, switched on to let's give this a second life rather mm. than let's buy something and then send it to the fucking op shop next week. Yeah, you know? and that's the way everyone's going with a lot of things. Yeah, I look when I was, we were styling, uh, we took over uh, more space in St Kilda this year, and you know I didn't want to go to IKEA or Kmart to buy pieces. Like I'm going straight to Facebook Marketplace because I want a nineteen. 50s bar stand and I want, you know, vintage pieces that have got a story to tell them are made properly and made to last. Yeah, for sure. And that's probably going to be it with clothing. I remember there was a big study in Australia. We probably followed more the UK trends, which was that whole fast fashion. Europeans have never been about that. Europeans want quality. They want – they're happy to pay 700 euros for a Gore-Tex jacket because they see that as an investment, you know. It's like, well, that's going to do me – Five to ten years, I'm still going to get where I, and plus they get sub zero fucking temperatures in the middle of winter. Yeah. You know, we don't quite get that. And we complain about the weather in Melbourne, but it's not European cold. And you think about, you know, other states, but um, yeah, the, the Europeans always happily, they see clothing as an investment. You know, I want to buy the best quality, nicest fabrics, the nicest cut, because that's going to last me seasons. Where unfortunately Australia ten years ago with the you know fifteen years ago with online shopping we sort of followed the UK trend and went not nah, fast cheap disposable fuck it off but uh, but it, oh, that's how, that's going to have its day as well as we say and like I think sustainability is going to be a big thing we're starting to get audited by some of the major chains we sell to with how the pack the clothing's packaged where the cotton source from uh, you got to tick those boxes yeah. So what would you sort of say to some kid who would look at you and be like, man, you've worked in fashion for pretty much your whole career and now you have a successful brand that's been going for eight years. What would you say to them if they want to kick it off? What's the best thing to do? Get some blanks or just think outside the square? Start an online presence? What should they be fucking doing? Oh, Online's everything. 
So we started in a wholesale capacity going straight to stores. I'd say these days go straight to TikTok, go straight. You know, you, we did that because that's what you had to do. There was the gatekeepers to get your brand pass to get it onto people. And, you know, like I wanted to get it on people when I first started Wander and I, maybe if I didn't have the certain connections, it was like just get it on the ten coolest people you know. You you might have been like one of them. I got some T-shirts. <laughs> you might have been one of them. Uh, <laughs> fuck, I clearly need to know cooler people. But, um, you know, it was like Flago or someone. Like just look around your own circle and go, all right, mm. who's 10, 15 people I know personally? Get them onto it. Yeah. And that starts there, you know. They're going to rock out on a Friday night to an event or something wearing that. Someone's going to comment, what's that? Where's this brand from? That's mm -hmm. just any sort of little way. But uh, definitely TikTok. Um, that's probably one we slept on as well. I've been the same as you probably, you know, with the bar events, Facebook was everything and then the rug got ripped out from underneath you because it all became monetized, and then yeah. it shit pivoted to Instagram and you had to uh, adopt to a new platform and we'll probably let slow there on TikTok, you know, but TikTok's obviously become one of the biggest ones and the best thing about that is it still gives you organic reach. You can clock mm. into different markets. There's some brands coming up now and they're run by kids in their early 20s. And they're seeing global success, you know, selling their brand to UK and US and Europe, and it's based off it's based off TikTok. Mm. Know, but the key can... with those brands that I can't help but think, and there's a few that come to mind, is to when to get out, mm. right? Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not saying, and they might laugh if they heard it because they're like, "Well, we went from this to three million dollars to ten million, whatever." Mm. But I think picking the right time to get out mm. is, the, is the time when they do become successful. Mm. And that's what I was saying before, like post-COVID, you know, the, a lot of brands have just seen boom. Mm. That's all they've seen is boom times. But with every boom comes a, yeah, yeah. Comes a crash. A and correction. That, that's, what we've, that's what we've seen in 22. And I don't think this year is going to be that, you know, that much easier again. Mm. So it's going to be interesting, you know. But I suppose a lot of the online ones they're trading on the hype model, so it's more limited releases, tight, tight capsules. Get kids lining up out the front, posting yeah. it on social yeah. media. So they're that's, gonna... that's a tight drop. And that's everyone wants something they can't have, don't you? Yeah. So, you know, that's one of the key elements of marketing is you know, something that's unobtainable or you really want to get it. You can't get it. I got told I needed to get these Adidas shoes the other day that they'd look good with my outfit and I jumped online Subtype was sold out and Adidas was website was sold out. And by the time I checked 10 different stores, I couldn't find them anyway. I wanted them twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I kind of wanted them before, but now I really want them. You know, there you go. They're sold out everywhere. Um, man, we've talked shit for a couple of hours. We're probably going to wrap it up soon. Is there anything you want to tell us what's coming up for Wanderer in the future? Shout outs to people or anything that I haven't asked that you want to talk about? God, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I don't know where. Look. We got exciting drops coming through. I'm pretty excited about our first proper sort of tracksuit set. So we shot that this week in uh, Johnny Vincent Sam's, is it? Uh, the Sushi Mango Boys restaurant on Ligon oh, yeah. Street. Yeah, is that what it's called? Just their names. Johnny Vincent Sam, is it? Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. The Italian wrestling. Who were the go. models? Uh, I actually jumped in. Budget's hot. Uh, <laughs> uh, my boy Tane, who's sort of in the music industry. Um, but we wanted to go for like a soprano style vibe. I wanted that, you know. Yep. Real Sopranos type scene sitting in the Italian diner. Um, yeah, so got that coming through. We've got a lot of new exciting product for winter. Yeah. Looking at just more some little up and coming collaborations um, with some Melbourne businesses. Nice. Shout out the Melbourne story. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And no, no individuals that you want to sort of shout out before we wrap it up, man? No, nah, I'm all good. You're all good? <laughs> Has anyone been that nice to me? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> all right. oh, oh, well, obviously, no, I should say Brendan. Because he's a massive part of it and he's probably my other half. And He's more behind the scenes. Yeah, but in, in all – we found the person. So Brendan, for those people that don't know, he's 50% owner of Wanderer. Um, and I'd known him for about 10 years. He was actually one of the first accounts I picked up when I started selling Mickey Six and everything. And he had the big go-to stores in Bendigo, Ballarat. And quite funny, I remember I emailed him the catalogues and he, you know, hounding him on the phone, didn't get through – and then eventually he's answered the phone one day and he's like, listen, mate, you got 60 seconds and I'm hanging up the phone, so give me your spiel. And I gave him, sp oh, it's this new brand we're selling here. I think it really, blah, blah, blah. All right, done. See you later. And he hung up the phone. And I was sort of, all right, sat around the office and it must have been the end of the day, like five o'clock. And so, all right, I'm knocking off. Walked out to my car 10 minutes later or whatever and jumping in the car. And as I got in the car, the 
number came back up or Ballarat came up on the screen in the car and he was ringing me back and he said, all right, I just opened the fucking email. You got my attention, mate. This is pretty bloody good, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so he put the brands in the store and for 10 years he had huge success, huge success with the brands. Um, we built a really sort of tight relationship over that point in time. One, we were both in London, so he'd often go over with his family to London, June, July for the sort of English summer. I was there for the fashion week. I'd done Berlin, then Amsterdam, then we were there for the London fashion week. And, yeah, we had a crazy, crazy fucking night. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we started off at Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, uh, the Savoy Hotel. And who's the – Noah Taylor was sitting there at the table next to us. He was clearly out on a date or something, an English actor. And you know, what was it? Uh, Pete got up at one point in time or something. No, the, Noah Taylor's date got up to go off to the toilet – and he leant over, he's like, excuse me, boys, I couldn't help but notice a bit of the native twang there. He's got an English accent. Native he's been, twang. He's got, been over there for so long. He's like, yeah, you're obviously Australians. Yeah, yeah, we're all Aussies. He's like, where are you from? Brent's like, I'm Ballarat. He's like, oh, get out of here. I'm a country boy myself. And next thing they're talking about, Tony Lockett apparently from Ballarat and how he became a greyhound breeder post-football. Yeah, yeah. Next minute I'm sitting in the Savoy, one of the grandest of London hotels in Gordon Ramsay's restaurant and I've got my bit now business partner, but Brendan's sitting there with Noah Taylor and they're talking about tossing off greyhounds together, <laughs> <coughs> which is apparently how you ha what you have to do to get to actually breed them, that you've got to jerk the greyhound off. And just as his dates, so the conversation went there and then just as his dates coming back from the toilet, he looked over and said, oh, shit, I better get back to my lady, but just quickly, boys, how do you know if your grandmother has AIDS or Alzheimer's? We don't know. Well, drop her off 30 k's out of town. If she comes home, don't fuck her. <laughs> <laughs> Turned around and went back to his date. <laughs> and, yeah, the, that was at the Savoy. The night got crazier and crazier from there. But when I ended, left uh, Shy Clothing, he popped into mine and I thought, you know, I'd need someone maybe with some capital and with some infrastructure to help and me get the brand off. Greyhound tossing off experience. <laughs> well, not him, Tony Lockett <laughs> Tony they were talking Lockett. about. Okay. I should be very clear him. Yeah. Hopefully Brendan's never tossed off a greyhound, but I'd, <laughs> I don't say that with all sincerity and with all... Uh, not sure. Um, but, yeah, when I approached him, he was sort of – he'd been doing a little brand called Jimmy Royale um, and they got into about two or three little stores and was sort of just doing it as more of a little side project, him and a guy, Travis Price, designer from Ballarat. Um, so when I approached him, I sort of knew it was like he wanted to get into wholesale and he had his eyes on doing something like that. And it's been a beautiful synergy in marriage ever since. And probably if I could say one thing, if anyone is going into a partnership, you've got to be completely different. Mm. You've got to be Complement each other. Yeah. Because if you two are the same people, that you just butt, you would just butt heads and you just bring in the same thing to the table. And I've seen it with a couple of brands you've probably seen pop off over the last couple of years where it's mm. been two guys that started and, and very, 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 very quickly suddenly one guy's the face of it. Yeah. Um, we work very well together because we are completely different people. Mm. So his skill set is nothing like my skill set and my skill set is nothing like his. Yep. So I'm product, creative, sales and he's inventory, accounts, invoicing, placing the bulk orders, dealing with China, logistics, all that sort of thing. And I'm, All the boring shit. <laughs> yeah, but he loves that. He, yeah. you know, like uh, the way I look at, you know putting together a new range, he'd look at an Excel spreadsheet and get excited over it. Yeah, that's what you <laughs> and need. And that's, that's why it works, you know. Yeah. So if you're going to have a business partner in something, and I think that applies to any industry, any business, you've totally. got to have a completely different skill set, you yeah. know. I need a technology person that likes recording and editing. That yeah. would be great. And if you had someone that wanted to be a podcast host in here, you know, <laughs> and, and smash piss, you're probably not going to work <laughs> together because, like, I'm good at that myself. Yeah, I've, I can got, do that. I tick those boxes. I'm, the, I'm that guy. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, man. That's no, you, you, you're totally right, and I think that that's the two people can do the job of one person really well. If that mm. makes sense, if that makes sense, like mm. so, like what two people can achieve because you know your strengths and you know your weaknesses. Mm. So if you find the right person that you click with, yeah. that's that's how a beautiful partnership. Is, yeah. And you've obviously and you've got to have a lot of faith in one another. You yeah, know, trust. So yeah. He looks at sometimes what I'm doing with product, and he's like, I don't fucking see where you're going here. I don't get it. I don't think it's going to sell. I just trust me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And But the beautiful thing is when you're in the business partnership, it's like, I hope I'm wrong because yeah. if I'm wrong, <laughs> yeah, 
and it flies and it works, then that's great. I'll still win. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know? it. I'm not losing the argument because I'm winning if it sells. And I guess from and it, he's just got to put that faith in me and trust me that you know I'll make to make that call. Yeah, and I guess to be a partner with somebody for seven years not only says well, that you're successful. Longer, eight, eight years. Eight now, but we started in 2015. So don't forget we worked on it for six to eight months prior before prior to launching. Mm, yeah, and so that's it. That says a lot about your partnership is that you not only have been successful, but you also have stayed civil and yeah. no one has tried to buy the other uh, person out. He'll probably want to thump me after this and they have to, <laughs> you He's know. Like, I thought they, this was promo. The little sound bite that you get out is like, apparently Brendan t- tosses off Greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll say that I'll edit it, but I won't. I'll no, no. Yeah. All right. Well, Steve, Kirby, from Wanderer, thanks for coming, man. I appreciate it. Let's Sorry just... it took me so long, but no, it's been great to sit down here and shoot the shit with you, brother. Thanks, man. I appreciate you coming in. More beers. All the best. Cheers. Thanks, Maloney. <laughs> 3,000. 3,000.